So welcome. It's quarter past two, so it's time to, to start with uh, the Excellence Day 2023. Uh, my name is Elena Bianchi. I've been uh, managing the awards uh, for 14 editions uh, already with great pleasure. And of course, for me, it's today an honor uh, to be the facilitator of today. I have the difficult task of uh, ensuring that we stick uh, to the time. Uh, because we have a lot of presentations, a lot of stories, ideas to share. Um, so it's, uh, it's very nice to, to have you here in this magical place of uh, Fondazione Cini. Um, as you have seen, we don't have the program uh, printed, uh, but you can scan this QR code it's, uh, or uh, using the posters uh, here at Cini. Um, so you find on the program not only the, the list of the, the winners, but also the biography and the photos of the speakers of today. And the idea is to facilitate then during these days of the summit, the network among you, because there are wonderful uh, people uh, among you from all over Europe. So it's definitely a golden opportunity for you to learn from each other. Um, and the only publication that we have here today is the awards publication um, featuring the 30 winners of this year. You find it at the entrance. Uh, if, you, if there are no copies left, don't worry, because they will be distributed also at the ceremony tomorrow. Uh, it's the result of uh, hard work uh, of my team at Europa Nostra, coordinated by Audrey. So thank you, Audrey for putting everything together. It's a wonderful uh, publication. Um, some of you might have been here uh, already in this room, because in 2021, uh, we had uh, our awards ceremony of that year. But of course, it was during the pandemic, so we had a lot of restrictions. We are very happy to have the opportunity to be here again with a larger group uh, of people. And it's uh, also possible, thanks to the support and the collaboration of the wonderful uh, Fondazione uh, Giorgio Cini. So it's my pleasure uh, to give the floor to Chiara Casarin. She's the head of cultural development and communication of Fondazione Cini for a short uh, welcome speech. Chiara, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to, to everyone. Um, I'm going to read a few words and uh, a very warm, uh, warm welcome on behalf of Renata Codello, the Secretary General of Fondazione Giorgio Cini, who could not be uh, with us today. I would like to thank Europa Nostra, its President Cecilia Bartoli, and its Secretary General Zneska Mihailovic for this collaboration, which I am pleased to welcome because of the excellence for their long work, work in defining European way of life, cultural and natural heritage. The Giorgio Cini Foundation, since 70 years, works in collaboration with many international institutions. And the one with Europa Nostra is aiming to create a new model of culture a great network between all humanistic and scientific disciplines. A month ago in this room, we hosted the fourth soft power conference that uh, put the culture at the core of the cooperation and cultural cooperation. Today with Europa Nostra, we are pursuing this important goal to celebrate its excellence day. Over the years, Europa Nostra has succeeded in bringing together different generations by creating new proposals for the enhancement of uh, Europe's great cultural heritage. The occasion of hosting the winners of the European Cultural Heritage Awards offers me the opportunity to underline how collaboration between local, national, and international institutions is essential to create and sustain a network, to disseminate knowledge, and many possible answers to the crucial problem of our time. 
I wish everyone a good work and congratulations in particular to the prize winners. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chiara, for sharing these words by your Secretary General. Uh, please um, thank also on our behalf your colleagues, uh, Maria Novella, Gloria, Irene, Carlo, who have supported us enormously and very professionally these days. Um, so before starting with the first presentation, I would like to spend a few words uh, for, um, to thank uh, very much uh, the members of the selection committees and the jury who every year really invested uh, invest a lot of time and commitment for making the selection of the winners. It's a lot of responsibility uh, for them and uh, they do it on a voluntary basis. Uh, they, are all, uh, they are professionals from all over Europe um, and so we, we could not do uh, without uh, their uh, in, uh, valuable um, contribution to the selection. So uh, I will give the floor to the, I cannot give the floor to all of them now, so I would like to give the floor to the chair of the jury, Bertrand de Fedo, for some introduction to the Excellence Day. Thanks a lot, Helena. You know that Helena did a beautiful job. <laughs> yeah, you have to with Audrey and all the team of Europa Nostra. Personally, I am honored to represent the jury uh, on this occasion and say just a few remarks of, on such a fantastic and inspiring day before leaving the stage to the real protagonist, the award winners, you in the room. Where to start? Let me first begin by thanking the other members of the selection committees and the jury, many of them present in this room today. We became day after day like friends, excited about your beautiful project. They are an impressive group of experts in the field of cultural heritage who share their valuable insights on a voluntary basis, as you know, said right now. Thanks also to Europa Nostra for the honor of chairing the awards jury for the year 2023, and for having trusted me with this important role. And thanks you to the European Commission for the outstanding and essential partnership in this award scheme over the past 20 years. And finally, let me thank the Foundation Chini for partnering with us on this event. As every year, the selection process has not been an easy one due to the impressive number of high-level projects we had the chance to read about and to evaluate. Just to give you an idea on the scale of this edition, we have received and evaluated a total of 2,025 2, entries. 225 2, entries. Citizen engagement and awareness rising saw so the highest number of submitted projects, 70. Then conservation with 54, research with 34, education training and skills with 46, and heritage champion with 21. Among the 30 winners, you can see extraordinary examples of love, lifelong dedication to culture, conservation projects which brought back to outstanding sites to their original splendor and cutting edge research on beautiful examples 
of our shared heritage. Many of the winning projects are success successful and inspiring examples fostering a more sustainable and equitable future, as well as a spirit for togetherness and a sense of belonging. Tangible and intangible heritage are both widely represented and celebrated, as well as heritage skills, which is especially relevant on the occasion of the European Year of Skills. To be among the winners means to become part of a white network of cultural heritage professionals, and so to access a privileged platform for knowledge sharing, the exchange of opportunities, and who knows, maybe even future collaborations. To be among the winners is the official recognition of your efforts and your project are as best practices in the field. So, the biggest thanks and congratulations go, of course, to the winners of this year. I truly hope that the power of the example of this project will inspire many of you, give you new ideas, and that they are a source for future reflections. Thank you very much, and bravo for the winners. Thank you very much, uh, Bertrand. Merci beaucoup for setting up the tone uh, of the event. So we can uh, now really start with the presentations. As you can see, we have five groups um, of presentations which reflect the five categories of the award. Uh, each uh, speaker will have five minutes. Uh, they have prepared either video or PowerPoint um, presentations. They will be uh, alerted uh, about the time left uh, on the screen. And um, as you probably have seen, we are recording uh, the event, so we are not uh, doing the live streaming, but we will um, then upload uh, the video presentations on our a website, so you will be able to share it uh, afterwards. And there's also an official uh, photographer here in the room, Felix, he will take photos. They will also be uh, available uh, for you. Um, so we can start with uh, the first category, uh, conservation and adaptive reuse. I invite on stage uh, Pavel uh, Proza. He's the owner, architect, project manager at Rio Frio Architects for the Steam Engine Brewery in Lubeck, Czechia. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor uh, to be with you today in Venice. I would like to present to you our project of saving and reviving the technical monument of the steam engine brewery in Lobech, which has been going on for 16 years. The first mention of our brewery dates back to 1586. The core of the building is Renaissance, but the current appearance has been changed by a late 19th century rebuilding. The beer production stopped during World War II, but the site and the site started falling into ruins. My wife and I, as young architects, discovered the forgotten brewery on the random trip in 2007. We became interested in it, and after a few weeks, we became its owners. We began the process of surveying, researching, designing, and finally a careful structural restoration. The work was mainly supported by friends and volunteers. From the beginning, we tried to present the project publicly. 
and the brewery became an open space for alternative culture. All this was done in close cooperation with heritage institutions. In 2009, the brewery was declared as a culture monument that helped us to obtain fun financial support from public sources, including support from the European Union. Despite this, funds were very rare and the progress was slow. We were working on uh, the restoration of uh, the roofs for years. The breaking point was the restoration of the front facade, which finally transformed the impression of a ruin into an attractive heritage building. The building work was carried out carefully using traditional building techniques and materials. Gradually, the brewery became a culture project with a mix of non-commercial and commercial functions to ensure the sustainability of the site's operations. A tour circuit for visitors became the basis. In 2014, we made an exhibition on the history of the brewing in Lobech, available to visitors through regular guided tours. The brewery is located is located in an attractive protected landscape area not far from Prague. That fact helped our brewery to become an important tourist attraction in the region. In 2015, after 72 years, we succeeded in reviving the brewing tradition in Lobech in the form of small craft brewery. Beer is the key culture value for our country restoring the tradition and presenting the historical brewery as a monument is very important to us. We have built a brewery tap room in the old brew house. In 2018, we opened the kitchen for visitors, offering traditional Czech cuisine. We also built four loft apartments for guest accommodation. The brewery in Lobech has gone has gone from a forgotten ruin to a living place that the local community is once again proud of. The brewery provides more than 10 jobs positions. The project is environmentally friendly. It is an example of successful management with limited financial sources and a proof that dreams can come true. Thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Pavel. Very well-deserved applause for such a private uh, initiative that you started when you were a young uh, couple. It's really a very nice example. So from uh, Czechia, we move to Denmark with uh, Jakob Ingvarsen, heritage uh, specialist, architect, and construction economist at Noor & Sigurd uh, Arctic Firma and responsible for the restoration of the Freeluftschule Open Air School in Copenhagen, Denmark. The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, I'm here to talk about the, the Freeluftschule. This is a holistic restoration of the Open Air School in uh, Copenhagen. Um, uh, the Freeluftschule Open Air School in Copenhagen was designed by Kai Gottlob in 1938. And it was uh, renovated by the owner, city of Copenhagen, with the help of uh, our company, Nørn Seaskov Architecture Company, and a lot of uh, other partners. This masterpiece of Danish functionalism was designed uh, with the focus on the sunlight, health, and fresh air. It had a unique program for weak children needing more space and medical treatment, and aimed to, talk, uh, to tackle the epidemic of uh, the tuberculosis. Uh, the school is protected and have, has a long history of uh, redirected uh, proportionals. Therefore, we began a thorough research of the original design and uh, map out the current user's needs. The aim of our work was to modernize the functionality of the school, uh, to create a contemporary and up-to-date environment that was inclusive uh, for children with disabilities. Uh, the task of the project was uh, sustainable renovation, which 
included the climate adaptation and the energy efficiency, indoor air quality, all by enhancing the original design. Uh, we, worked, we worked on this project on the three levels, uh, the preservation, the modernization, and the sustain sustainability were by moving new f modern functions to suitable rooms or rather than rebuilding rooms that had uh, conflict with the, the original designs. I'll show you uh, here at the end a uh, list of pictures, uh, original and before the restoration and, and after the renovation. And we start here by the upstairs dormitory. The dormitory was uh, built for the children to uh, relax, have treatment in sunlight and in fresh air. Uh, it was in the 80s uh, completely uh, abandoned, abandoned uh, because of asbestos in, uh, in, in all the building materials. So when, uh, when we came and rebuilt this, we uh, used it again as a, a room for the children to uh, to have the breaks in, but this time uh, as an active break because the disabled children didn't need rest, they needed uh, a place where they could they could have uh, breaks. So instead of the asbestos floor, we put in this rubber floor for them to to play on. On the north corridor of the corridor of the uh, of the building, there's also this place originally where the children could enjoy the sunlight as a part of the treatment. Uh, this was in the 80s uh, completely destroyed by um, plaster walls and plaster ceilings and uh, all the details was gone. We recreated this corridor with, with uh, uh, as originally uh, wooden panels and glass uh, walls, but uh, in order to meet the building code, we, we uh, used um, fireproof glass and uh, fireproof uh, wooden details, but uh, yeah. And uh, on, on the um, south part of the, the school, we had this uh, classrooms uh, where the, the children could have uh, education in, in fresh air, uh, and the fresh, the open air school. Uh, th this was uh, n n newly renovated now again with uh, with uh, fixed light fixtures as uh, of today, uh, but uh, as a copy of of, of the old ones. Uh, we made a great effort to make all the original uh, wooden uh, glass doors and. Uh, and walls uh, able to reopen so the school could function again as it, as it used to do. Uh, that was from the Kai Gottlob, uh, the original architect, a great emphasis on, on, uh, on the hallways and the colors in, in this project. And, and uh, of course, uh, this has also uh, um, ha had our intention to, to recreate all the, what was lost of the, of the colors and the color. Uh, scheme, but in a in a new modern uh, paint and uh, that was suitable for, for, for children. And uh, last, yeah, I'll just show the the Morris, uh, the, the fountain, oh, sorry, uh, where the, the, the children could uh, get the fresh drinking water. As, as, was in a wheelchair, the children are not able to drink from this fountain. Uh, and especially not this one, but uh, when, when we re renovated this one, it was, it was not as a drinking water fountain, but a fountain which uh, could uh, pr provide uh, fresh drinking water from, uh, uh, no, no uh, sorry, uh, could, where the children can interact and sense the water with the sound and the feel and, and the press a little button uh, to activate the, the fountain. Um, just uh, to complete this, uh, I need to say that controlling all these technical installations demands an all 3D model built on uh, the real world. All installation should be as original intended, and this is possible with uh, careful planning. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done. Thank you, uh, Jakob, uh, for sharing uh, this restoration which uh, can serve definitely as a model for other schools uh, in Europe and also demonstrates uh, the way in which architecture can contribute to the health and well-being. So thanks a lot. So from Denmark, uh, we travel to France, Paris. We have here uh, Edouard de Lumley, 
uh, the director of uh, cultural development audiences at uh, Centre de uh, Monument Nationaux, and he will present us the Hotel de la Marine. Hello. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy and honored to be able to present to you today a project laid by the Centre des Monuments Nationaux, uh, which mobilized the teams, our teams for more than five years. The Centre des Monuments Nationaux uh, is an, an, uh, um, an institution of the French Ministry of Culture that is in charge of more than 100 monuments around France from prehistoric caves uh, to the 20th century villas. Uh, in 2022, the Semen monuments uh, welcome uh, more than 10 million visitors. Uh, the project of the Hotel de la Marine uh, was, uh, for many reasons, uh, a, a very special project for the Centre des Monuments Nationaux. Uh, sp a particular project uh, uh, in terms of method of financing, since the, uh, the financing of the project is based on a vast majority on a bank loan, which is very special for uh, a, public, a public organization. And also very special for the, the principle of restoration we, uh, we decide to prevail in the conduct of the project. The Hotel de la Marine is located on the place of the La Concorde in the, in the heart of Paris. Originally, King Louis XV decided to establish a place, uh, a place royale on the seat of a land belonging to the crown. The project was entrusted after several competitions to the architect Ange Jacques Gabriel, who decided on the construction of the two pavilions that would border the square. The right pavilion intended the house of Crown Furniture Guard, or uh, Garde Meuble de la Couronne, was built between 1758 and 1774. In 1755, the, the Garde Meuble moved into the building. Uh, it, remain, it remained un there until the French Revolution, when the Ministry of the Navy, uh, which had to leave uh, Versailles, moved into the building. The Semen took over management uh, of the building in 2015, uh, when the head headquarter of the French Navy uh, left the, the building. The project conducted by the, the CMN uh, has many ac different actors. The chief, the chief architect of historical, mon historical monuments, Christophe Bottineau, was in charge of the project with the scenographer uh, Alain Moati, archi architect, and also with, which is very uh, specific for this project uh, for us, the intervention of two decorators, uh, Joseph Ashkar and Michel Charrière, who um, give a really a special uh, uh, line to the, to the project of restoration, and uh, that was decisive for the success of the project. The project in figures, some figures that show the scale of the project, a budget of 130 million euros, 40 companies mobilize, mobilized, uh, on the project, uh, 2,700 uh, square meters of uh, renovated area in which uh, 6,200 square meters are open to the public. And uh, which is also special, the, the, the floors two, three, and four have been converted into offices and are rented, uh, which ensures the financing of the project. To, uh, to finance the, uh, the loan of the, the bank loan. Two restaurants have been set up on the, floor, on the ground floor. The building also houses on the ground floor the, uh, the workshop of the company Mathieu Lustrerie, and on the first floor is located the Altani collection, which uh, ensures the production of two exhibitions uh, per year. 
in addition to the presentation of works from the collection uh, of, his, of their own collection. Uh, a special restoration has been undertaken for the apartment of the attendant of the Crown furniture, for which we have decided to restore this his condition of uh, uh, the condition it was before the revolution, in accordance with the, the precise information available to us in the inventories. This state corresponds globally of the last uh, of the period of the last intendant of the garde meuble, Marc-Antoine Thierry de Villabré. You see six uh, princip big principles we use for this restoration. The idea is to, be, to, to do something very immersive. And uh, for example, uh, we use textile of the 18th century whenever possible. Otherwise, uh, the reviewing of textiles in accordance with the description, description of the inventories. And we decide to uh, um, to make very discreet all the mediation um, uh, um, dispositive on the on the on the on the tour. Um, no, many partners who uh, who, uh, who are in the projects to um, to um, loan uh, different uh, furniture. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, of uh, different uh, uh, firms who are working on uh, métiers d'art who are involved in the project in the project that give the, the new splendor of the of the place. Uh, immersive explanation and cultural mediation. The Seinemann has entered into a partnership with Radio France to produce an innovative mediation proposal for the public who participate in the immersion, which participate in the immersion uh, in the 18th century. The audio tour is an invitation to dive into the 18th century society, an invitation to the intendant of the garde meuble. And in the salon of the 19th century, an innovative digital cultural mediation is offered to the visitors uh, to uh, uh, give all the information about construction of the building, the organization of the furniture storage, and the main actors and the explanation about the main actors of the project. The period of occupation of the building by the sellers is also mentioned. The entire mediation has been designed to be an, as universal as possible and accessible to the visually impaired and people with disabilities. Special attention to the family audience has been developed with a shared audio tour inviting dialogue between adults and children who make the visits. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for this extensive uh, presentation and for stressing all the innovative aspects of this marvelous uh, restoration. So from Paris, we come back to Venice, uh, because we have now the winner from Venice uh, presenting. It's, um, I would like to invite uh, Adele Rere Baudengo, uh, president of the Venice Gardens Foundation. She will present the Royal Gardens of Venice. Some of you might have seen the gardens uh, this morning. Others might, uh, I hope, will uh, join us for the unveiling of the plaque uh, tomorrow morning at 9. You are all invited. But first, I would like to give the floor to Adele. The floor is yours. Yes, so we can start. Uh, yeah. We show first a video, and then she will say a few words. Enjoy.
I hope you will forgive my poor English. I wish to express our gratitude for this important recognition. It is an honor to be awarded with the most prestigious European Prize for Cultural Heritage in support of the restoration of the Giardini Reali. This project was guided by the principles of Venice Gardens Foundation, restoration and conservation of parks, gardens, and sites of historical and cultural interest, promoting, developing, and carrying out projects and to protect botanical and cultural heritage, fostering the connection with nature. The foundation, with great dedication, passion, and sense of responsibility, continues to look after the Royal Garden with particular attention to sustainable maintenance by cultivation without synthetic chemicals and with a composting system. Conservation of natural resources, recycling, reuse of existing physical elements, and irrigation by means of a well. Increasing biodiversity to attract bees and the other pollinating insect and bird population. Today, the Royal Gardens, with the intervention of the landscape architect Paolo Peirone and architect Alberto Torsello, have returned to play a central role for Venice. I also wish to thank for the supporting and believing in our foundation, l'Agenzia dei De Magno, the Mayor of Venice, la Superintendenza Archeologia delle Belle Arti e Paesaggio, and of course, Europa Nostra. And last, but not least, our main partner, Generale Assicurazioni, that has made possible the restoration with the CEO Philippe Donnet, Simone Bemporat, and Emma Ursic. My personal thanks go to our head gardener, Edoardo Bodi, and all the foundation team that they care of the garden every day. The foundation is now working on the new project that will be completed next year, the restoration and conservation of the Orto Giardino del Convento della Chiesa del Santissimo Redentore. And uh, let me hope that this new project will merit a second award by Europa Nostra. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Adele, for this presentation. And uh, just a curiosity, tomorrow at the uh, ceremony, there will be a green carpet, which, uh, which at the end of the event will, she, which will be brought to Redentore. So we are already contributing uh, to this new project. But I strongly advise you to visit Giardini Reali if you have not done it. It's uh, really a paradise next to San Marco Squares. Okay, then from Venice, we traveled all the way north to Lithuania. I uh, would like to invite uh, Indre. Oh, your last name is difficult. <laughs> Uso Taye, head of the Museum of Urban uh, Wooden Architecture under the directorate of Vilnius Memorial Museums. Uh, she is here to present the Museum of Urban Wooden Architecture in Vilnius. Indre. <laughs> Uh, hello, um, I'm Indriu Jotaite. I'm the head of the Museum of Urban Wooden Architecture in Vilnius, Lithuania. And today my aim is to briefly introduce the restoration of the museum building, um, which is only the third Lithuanian project to win this prestigious award. Uh, so what is uh, MOVA? Uh, firstly, it is an old... Uh, uh, wooden house in the historic suburb of Vilnius, Lithuanian capital. And our, uh, after our project is an example of sensitive restoration and reuse of uh, urban wooden architecture. Even though uh, timber-based architecture is considered to be typical of Lithuania, it uh, hasn't received enough attention. 
Uh, protecting uh, heritage from urban development is not an easy task, but uh, preserving uh, small wooden houses is even harder. Uh, the decision to restore the building and to establish the museum uh, was made by Vilnius City Municipality in 2018. And the project was financed by uh, European Union and Vilnius City Municipality. Uh, conservation took uh, about three years, and during them, uh, almost 70% uh, uh, of uh, original uh, constructions and about 80% uh, of uh, authentic uh, uh, wooden carvings uh, have been uh, restored uh, and preserved. So uh, what, what was the biggest challenges of this project? Uh, it was to restore the geometry of the house uh, and to preserve authentic plaster on the walls, uh, which uh, had been uh, badly damaged during structural work. Uh, the extent restoration uh, efforts were not only about preserving the past, but also about adapting the house for the modern use. And the result uh, of these efforts is an example of sustainable, environmentally friendly uh, architecture on a human scale. Uh, but what really uh, sets this project apart is uh, that uh, the museum activities continue uh, the concept of preserving the house, creating a unique uh, social and cultural uh, value for our uh, communities. This restoration project is about inviting everyone to uh, pay attention to the wooden architecture uh, around us in the cities. Um, as we conclude, it is essential uh, to acknowledge uh, the incredible dedication and hard work uh, of the specialists who were involved in this uh, three years restoration journey. Uh, without uh, their um, expertise and commitment, this project would have not been possible. Uh, we also extend our gratitude uh, heartful gratitude to the European Commission and Europa Nostra organization for recognizing the uh, significance of our project. So thank you, and thank you for your all attention. Thank you very much, uh, Indre. So for the moment, we skip uh, the presentation of uh, uh, Sivdos altarpiece in uh, St. Mary's Basilica in Krakow, because this the speaker is traveling at the moment to, to Venice. Uh, you will listen to him at the very end uh, of the program. So from um, then uh, we can uh, immediately go to um, Portugal. I would like to invite uh, Francisco Antonio de Claude Souza, who is the Director of Cultural Heritage Services at Regional Secretariat of Tourism and Culture uh, Regional uh, Directorate of um, Heritage Service. He's presenting uh, us today the restoration of the Mudejar ceilings of the Cathedral of Funchal on Madeira. The floor is yours. So you can use this ring. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, to speak about uh, the restoration of the ceilings. Of the Cathedral of Funchal. It was a big project for a small island in the Atlantic and was a project with a, uh, the finance of the uh, European community and also the Portuguese and Madeira government. And I will say that Madeira and this cathedral uh, is very important in the context of the Portuguese Renaissance because it's the 
first dioceses, like the king called it, from the unknown world. Uh, it was built in the beginning of the 16th century, and the king, Emmanuel I, say and understand the construction of the cathedral like the total work, the way to show his power and the way he's trying to redefine the frontiers uh, of the known world. That's the aspect of the Cathedral of Funchal before the work begin. And I would like to say that we involve 40 um, elements of the, um, the staff of the restoration with the collaboration also of the staff of the, the regional government. It was very dark and completely, um, it's practically impossible to see. A lot of dust and candle smoke. And this is part of the, the works of preparation of the restoration with um, people from the Portuguese Central Laboratory of uh, Restoration, uh, José de Figueiredo Institute. This is the beginning of the works, and this is now the cleaning, the process of cleaning of the ceilings. Uh, do not forget that this uh, work was all, um, developed during the COVID period. That's why it was so difficult in terms of logistics to organize everything. This is the work of the restoration. And that's important too. During the process of the restoration, we organized um, uh, visits to people who are interested in, in the works and also uh, with um, uh, children's. <clears throat> and that is the, the result of the restoration. And one of the aspects was because it is uh, 1,500 square meters of ceilings, and also was very important the work of lightening the ceiling because it's very difficult to see without a special uh, illumination. Uh, one of the aspects that's very important too is the way this ceiling connects two worlds. Uh, the, the base of uh, the Islamic um, taste with the uh, Iberian tradition of Morisk style. And this is the result, that the idea that the Cathedral of Funchal is a total work, is not only the ceilings, but also the altarpiece was uh, commended in Lisbon um, in the circles of the, the court in the beginning of the 16th century. And I would like to say, too, that work was completely impossible without a wonderful uh, staff and people who work with us uh, during all the process. And I will also, too, do a very personal um, uh, thanks. I would like to say thanks to my mother. She was director of the Museo of Art Sacra of Funchal, and I learned everything that I know today with her. And she's 87, and she suffered from Alzheimer. Mm -hmm. And I will say, for the end, la ringrazio con molta gratitudine e viva Venezia. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure that uh, 
for many of you, it's another site uh, on the wish list, uh, uh, places to visit in the coming months and years. Um, we stay close to Portugal, uh, we go to Spain. I would like to invite Josu Marotu uh, Panagarano and uh, Ainara Irots Zalba, architects and uh, architectural technician at Deputacion Foral de Gijipuza, uh, representatives of uh, Deba Bridge. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, you can click on the green. Yes. Okay. Today, we would like to share with you the remarkable story of the Deva Bridge and its journey from the brink of collapse to restoration. On that fateful day, the 5th of July 2018, the central pier of this historic stone bridge experienced an abrupt settlement, causing severe damage to its audience and bolts. The structure that had stood strong for over a century was on the verge of complete collapse. The Deva Bridge is no ordinary bridge. It's a testimony of, of exceptional civil engineering and is protected as a historical landmark along the famous Camino de Santiago pilgrimage route in Europe. In 2015, the coastal road was declared a UNESCO heritage, World Heritage Site, attracting even more visitors, from, uh, visitors and pilgrims from around the world. Designed by Antonio Cortázar and completed in 1866, this bridge connects the picturesque coastal towns of Deva and Mutriku, allowing people to cross the mouth of the Deva estuary. Today, it serves as a thoroughfare for pedestrians, connecting both local and distant communities. The partial collapse of the bridge and its subsequent closure for several months brought for a deeper appreciation for its functional, cultural, landscape, sociological, and technical importance. Recognizing the special protection status of this heritage asset, immediate action was necessary to prevent its loss. Given the financial and technical challenges faced by the small municipalities who share the bridge, the rehabilitation project was taken up entirely by the Department of Culture of the Provincial Council of Gipuzkoa. The Provincial Council, fully aware that restoration was the only viable option, decided to proceed with emergency works, even though the total cost of the project at that time was indeterminate. Inspection conducted shortly after the collapse revealed that marine woodworm Teredo Navalis had attacked and significantly weakened the wooden piles supporting the central pier. The central pile had collapsed, causing a one meter settlement from downstream. To address this precarious condition and ensure the safety of the bridge, an upper metal structure was installed to hang the bolts. This temporary structure also allowed the pedestrians crossing over the river, a commitment made by the provincial council at the beginning. Once stability was guaranteed through auxiliary measures, detailed rehabilitation design work began. This involved historical research and interdisciplinary technical cooperation. After considering various alternatives, the decision was made to underpin the collapsed central pier, carefully dismantle the damaged bolts, and rebuild them to their original geometry. The goal was to reduce as much of, of the original stone as possible, with only irreparable pieces being replaced. A stone from the nearby Lastur quarry, identical to the original, was used for this purpose. Out of the 1,400 aslar used in the reconstruction, 1,250 were recovered from the damaged bridge. Throughout the project, efforts were made to revive traditional trades and techniques while incorporating modern materials and methods. Collaboration with local companies and suppliers not only made the intervention more sustainable, but also preserved traditional trades at the local and European levels. The preservation of these ancient techniques played a significant role in enhancing our understanding of stone masonry bridge construction methods. The restoration of the Deva Bridge was not just about saving a historical structure. It was a unique opportunity to raise public awareness of the value of heritage structures, in particular the value of masonry bridges. 
To achieve this, an information stand on the project was set up near the bridge, and talks and guide tours were organized for both known experts and technical professionals. Rebuilding a stone bridge in the 21st century presented its own set of challenges. The technical complexity and cultural significance of this project set it apart as exceptional work of restoration and cultural dissemination. In closing, we would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to all the entities, companies, and individuals who made this restoration project possible. Your dedication and support have been essential in ensuring the preservation of our cultural heritage. We would also like to extend a special thanks to Europa Nostra for recognizing our efforts in safeguarding our safe heritage. This recognition serves as a strong motivation for us to continue our work for generations to come. Thank you. Miles Kerr. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Josue Ainara. We remain in Spain. Um, I would like to invite Andres Sabadell and Susana. Uh, founding partners uh, of Rodriguez uh, Valbena, Valbuena Architects, Architectos. They will present us uh, the ruins of the monastery of San Pre Pedro de Slonza. The floor is yours. The monastery of San Pedro de Slonza is a magical place. A visit to Eslonza is like going on a journey back in time. To stroll within its walls in the golden haze of sunset is to reconnect with nature. The history of Eslonza is a story of survival. Since the 10th century, the monastery has repeatedly fallen into disuse, only to rise again from the ashes. A controlled and supervised excavation of more than 3,000 tons of rubble until reaching the level of the original pavements, follow it by selecting and inventorying all the architectural pieces of interest. The ruins of the monastery of San Pedro de Slonza are an element of the landscape. With the aim of allowing tourist visit in safe conditions, wooden soaring has been installed in the passage holes. Aggregates as paving material allows the natural integration of the ruin. The following images show the transformation from ruins to a cherished community asset. The rehabilitation project is an initiative to care for the most disadvantaged through the use of heritage as an economic and social driver of a region mired in institutional abandonment. Small actions with a little budget, but which represent a titanic effort for an aging population at risk of social exclusion. The action carried out for the recovery of a historic ruin in a social and economical context so degraded is a fact full of symbolism and an example of European values.
The monastery is a small element on the Camino de Santiago, linking a network of heritage elements in Europe. The ruins of the Slontha Monastery have involved all sectors of the population. The participation of all administrations in the different projects carried out represents an innovative financial system. The recovery of ruins such as that of San Pedro de Slonza is a demonstration that not one in Europe is left behind and that the entire European population enjoys the same opportunities. Our team would like to thank the European Commission and Europa Nostra for this recognition from ourselves and on behalf of the local community who are so proud of their heritage being celebrated. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Andres and Susana. Um, we now uh, travel to the uh, UK. I would like to invite uh, Paul Simons, a chair at Cleveland Pools Trust, uh, who will today present as the project of the Cleveland Pools in Bath. The floor is yours, Simon. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Europa Nostra, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege to be here this afternoon. Um, this uh, project uh, in the city of Bath um, is a project about people. It's a community project. It was a community swimming pool when first built in 1815 and we believe that it's the oldest uh, open air public swimming pool of its type in Western Europe. Um, this is a photograph of the 1910s. Uh, when it was first built, um, it was built by uh, subscription by the men of the town of, uh, of the city of Bath um, who were artisans and professionals because men used to swim naked and they'd been forbidden from swimming naked in the river flowing through the city. And therefore, they decided that they would build their own swimming pool. Um, and here, uh, just to show where it is in relationship to the great uh, 18th century city, the whole of the city of Bath is a World Heritage Site. It is a great thermal spa town. It has Roman heritage and was completely rebuilt in the 18th century. The Roman town was that shape, and the medieval city never got any greater than that. In the 18th century, the city fathers destroyed the whole medieval city and built utopia. It was classicism for the future, and they were talking about the future. And our very tiny swimming pool was built, sorry, was built there, and it was originally a bend in the river. That bend in the river, you can see here clearly from the air, shows where the swimming pool was built using the river flowing naturally every day, uh, and feeding fresh water. And the cottage where the superintendent lived and the six changing rooms on either side uh, were built on a curve. And Bath has many curves, many crescents, of which its classical architecture is famous for as it built higher and higher up the hills of the valley surrounding it. It's also an impossible site to get to. There is no road access. There is a corridor coming down a very steep valley of a meter and a half wide, and then the river has now been covered by self-seeded trees on each bank, so you can't see it either, and all those trees are now protected. Uh, so how on earth were we going to get to this project if we were ever going to raise the money to preserve it? We have had over a 1,000 volunteers working over the last 19 years. It's, this project's nearly 20 years old. 
Um, when the city council uh, realized they owned this building, it had been forgotten about since 1984, they tried to put it on the market and sell it. Immediately, the local community went crazy and said, no way, you are not selling our swimming pool. They'd been built a nice new modern one, but they wanted this one back. And through a whole series of things like, this just represents oral history, going back to photographic archives, tracing these citizens who in the photographs are teenagers and are now grandparents like me, we were able to build up an amazing set of stories and, and oral records of the local community and what they thought about their swimming pool. And since we've continued that engagement right through the process of raising money, employing architects, getting the whole thing designed, we've had picnics for families, we've had school engagement, school acting out parts of the history that they've researched, young swimming clubs raising us money, and, and men dressing up in old swimming costumes and looking stupid. The, the volunteers have worked on everything from fundraising, maintaining the site, uh, academic research, running tours, engaging with the community, historical interpretation, and even the graphics that you see examples of here. And the school children drew the pictures that are on the ceramics at the bottom of the children's pool. So young children can swim down there and have a look at these graphics that tell them something of the history. Um, we've also engaged through foundations in, in the city of Bath, disadvantaged young adults with severe learning difficulties, and we asked them, how would they talk about the swimming pool? And they said, where is it? So they, they dressed up in swimming costumes, wandered around the streets, and were filmed asking the citizens, where's the swimming pool? And they told the story of reviving interest in this pool by trying to find it, and it raised huge interest. The project has won three national awards in the UK, two for heritage interpretation and community engagement, and this year we won the national award for conservation. So we're highly delighted to be here uh, in Venice with you all and such a distinguished uh, set of people here today that the stories we've been hearing from. Um, it w logistics was a nightmare. 85% uh, of all the materials were bought on the river and 100% of the waste was taken away on the river. No vehicle access at all. If only we'd come to Venice first and understood how they build in Venice, we, we might have learned a few things. Um, but this just shows some of the logistical problems that put over a million euros on the cost of executing this project. Um, we always had the dream, many graphics done by architects, of this is what we wanted to achieve. And that is what we have achieved. Um, it opened uh, last year. Uh, you can come and swim there now. And the, eventually, the water is going to be heated by a water source heat pump from the river. And that energy, free energy from the river, will keep 150 tons of carbon out of the atmosphere of the city of Bath every single year. So as well as thanking you, I'll just extend you an invitation. Next time you're in the UK, come and have a swim. Thank you. <laughs> We will definitely come. Uh, oh, such an inspiring story. Thanks a lot for sharing. Um, so this was the last uh, presentation from uh, category conservation and adapt reuse. So we can now move to uh, category research. Um, I would like to invite uh, the first speaker, um, Patrick Donabetian. Uh, he will uh, present uh, the research, scientific and archaeological studies for the preservation of Ere Ruik, a project with the collaboration of Armenia and France. You sat right in the back, <laughs> so <laughs> take some time. So this is the clicker. Thank you. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm also very honored to be here with you today. Um, I must say that I, I'm very sorry for our dear colleague and friend, Gaine Kastati, who should be here instead of me and make this uh, presentation. Uh, and unfortunately, she caught uh, the COVID and uh, she remained at our hotel. Uh, so, uh, we are going to present you 
the work, uh, the, the, the excavations, the, studied, the studies we conducted on this uh, site called, called um, Yereruik in the north-western uh, part of nowadays Republic of Armenia, almost on the boundary with Turkey. We worked there uh, s for seven years, from, uh, nine, uh, from 2009 to until 2016. And then, of course, we worked on our results, and we are preparing, preparing now a second step in the, the study of the site. So, but let's have a look at the, the, the presentation prepared by my uh, team. Ereruik is an outstanding example of Armenian artistic achievements, a monument unique and enigmatic, at the center of the debate on Armenian architectural history. In 2009, Patrick Donabedion started a comprehensive scientific and multidisciplinary research with the Laboratory of Medieval and Modern Archaeology in the Mediterranean of Aix-en-Provence, in collaboration with the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography of the Armenian Academy of Sciences, with the Shirak Regional Museum in Gimri, and with experts from different prestigious institutions and nationalities. Ereruk also served as a training site for local and international students. The research analyzed in depth not only the basilica, but also a building which may have served as a mausoleum, two repestrian rooms, the remains of an imposing boundary wall, and of a supposed dam. the vestiges of a Kurdish village, a unique necropolis south of the basilica, and the numerous carved stones resulting from the collapse of part of those monuments. of the research was presented to students and to the public, both in France and in Armenia, through full-day conferences, speeches and publications, which gained the recognition of the international scientific community. The researchers succeeded in dating the basilica, reconstructing its original appearance and conducting a detailed analysis of its stratigraphy and carved decoration. Through comparative research, the project also highlighted the particularities of Armenian Christianity and funerary costumes creating new knowledge about the late antique, early Christian period in Armenia. The wide set of information collected contributed to its listing among the seven most endangered heritage sites in Europe in 2016 and allowed for the design of a conservation project respectful of the monument's authenticity. Do you want to say something more? Yeah, sure, sure. Yes. With your permission, I would like to add some words. Uh, first, of course, a huge gratitude to uh, Europa Nostra uh, for uh, their contribution. It's not a new one. We have a, an old uh, cooperation with them, with you and uh, we are very grateful. Then I would like to say that this presentation was a good occasion to draw your attention on the very worrying state of the Armenian uh, cultural heritage in general, and especially in the most eastern part of uh, historical Armenia, where, you know, terrible events took place uh, uh, this, these last uh, 10 days, and until now, uh, are taking place. So um, I would like, uh, again with your permission, to mention that together with a certain number of colleagues, 
we are trying to present a new site which is uh, located in this, in the, the region in question called Nagorno-Karabakh or in Armenian Artsakh. It's a very important monastery called Dadivank and we, want, we would like to present it as a candidate for the seven most endanger, endangered of next year. So thank you also for your attention to this uh, candidature. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, uh, also for this uh, latest part of the presentation. Um, we now uh, come back to Veneto region. Um, I would like to invite uh, Deborah Howard, member of the scientific board of Centro Nazionale di Studi di Architettura Andrea Palladio. She will present us today the project on the proto-industrial uh, architecture of the Veneto in the age of Palladio. Deborah, the floor is yours. Well, I'm extraordinarily honored and privileged to be here um, and to be a recipient of this um, extraordinary award, um, which highlights the incredible contribution of Europa Nostra. Um, and of course, I um, Sadly, I'm no longer part of the European Commission, but um, my activities here allowed me to, um, to submit this um, presentation. It's not often realized that the remarkable career of the architect Andrea Palladio was underpinned by a dramatic expansion in manufacturing on the Venetian terraferma. So, what architectural traces of this industrial boom remain in the landscape today? And what is their state of preservation? In 2018, I was lucky enough to receive a grant from the Leverhulme Trust to investigate this proto-industrial legacy. And this funding, in turn, allowed me to engage three young Italian research assistants to help with the fieldwork and archival investigation. In an intensive program of fieldwork, we made site visits all across the Venetian terraferma, from Brescia to Friuli. We investigated a dazzling array of different activities, including flour milling, wool and silk production, mining, metalworking, paper manufacture, ceramics, saw milling, and leather tanning. The results of the research were published in a richly illustrated book in both English and Italian. And the following year, I curated an exhibition called Acqua Terra Fuoco at the Palladio Museum in Vicenza. And I have to say the collaboration and support of the Palladio Museum has been absolutely fantastic. And um, I'm terribly grateful uh, to the museum. The principal cities were already productive in the Middle Ages, as we can see in the Scazzeria in the center of Verona, which we used for the final teasling of the woven cloth. Vicenza, too, was a vibrant center of textile production. In the wave of new inventions in the 16th century, industrial activities spread to more rural settings in the foothills of the Alps. Here, the line of natural springs provided ideal sites for the exploitation of hydraulic energy. As mechanization became more ambitious, the Bolognese type of tall cylindrical mill for twisting and spinning silk spread across the Veneto, occupying high buildings that now look like urban palaces. As Sorry, it's not, it's not um, the, the slides help, yeah. are not changing. I'm, yeah, that's all right. Yes. Um, so here are the Bolognese silk mills. Okay, there we are. As we can see in this example at Nove, using a water supply from the river Brenta. So we hope to persuade the public 
that the early industrial sites are places of the greatest historical interest, often set in landscapes of outstanding natural beauty. Whereas villas, palaces, and churches are recorded and legally protected, the condition of these proto-industrial structures is very variable. Some are merely an archaeological sites, like the 34 lime kilns in Valcanzoi. Some are ruined or derelict, like the paper mills of Toscolano Maderno and Dueville, or the steep line of tanneries at Gallio. A few are lovingly maintained by local enthusiasts, as seen in the forge known as the Maglio Tamiello, or the sawmill of the Valle del Pasubio. Some are even still in full operation, such as the flour mills at Gran Cona and Godia. We were especially intrigued by the small manufacturing complexes where several initiatives exploited the same source of hydraulic energy. In this beautiful depiction of Solania from a map in the Venetian archives, the owner planned to install a new silk spinning mill and a fulling mill alongside his existing sawmill and ironworks. Sadly, the entire complex has been abandoned and is now overgrown with vegetation. This project provides a model for the study and conservation of the proto-industrial heritage of Europe, two centuries before the Industrial Revolution itself. This patrimony has much to teach us about the use of local materials, the ingenuity of machinery, and the conservation of natural resources. And in particular, the project has highlighted the advantages of water power as a clean, renewable, economical source of energy. And I really hope that um, this model can be used anywhere in Europe to investigate very early industrial activity, um, make it known, make it better understood, restore it where practical, um, and, and love it and look after it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deborah, for sharing this uh, exemplary uh, research, and uh, indeed a very uh, inspiration, big inspiration for, for the others uh, who are active in the, in the field of industrial heritage. Um, we would now go to, back to Portugal. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Pedro Antonio Vaz Cardoso, who is the Vice President of uh, Cantanhede City Council. He will present us um, the project Safeguarding of the Artisanal Fishing Technique Arte Xavega. Pedro, the floor is yours. Good afternoon to all of you present, members of the European Austria Federation, members of the European Commission, fellow speakers. On behalf of all those involved, we are pleased to be here, and it is a tremendous honor to receive this award. And we prepared a short video that we believe captures the essence of our project. Before doing so, allow me a brief introduction. Easily identified by its vessel and specific techniques on sandy beaches, and being one of the oldest types of artisanal and sustainable fishing. Art Chavia is a manifestation of a priceless, intangible cultural heritage. Moreover, being practiced for hundreds of years in Praia da Tocha by generations and generations of hardworking fishermen, it is arguably, undoubtedly, a cultural bastion of a municipality of Cantanhede in Portugal. Through innovative cultural, 
and educational pro programs, and always in close collaboration with the Anglers community and in partnership with Interpretation Center for Art Shavga. Several initiatives were implemented, ranging from the creation of didactic and scientific materials in Portuguese and English to the construction of a traditional boat. However, more than a prize, we receive this prestigious honor in the acknowledgement of all the devoted work produced by the entities who contributed to this project, namely the fishing community of Tosha Beach. This award is from them to them. And having said so, based on the need to mobilize wills and efforts around the common European heritage of quality, humanism, and unity in diversity. From now on, our desire is when and only to ensure that the Art Shavga, one of the most notable and symbolic features of Cantanied coastline, does not disappear, and that new links are forged with other resistant fishing practices on the European continent. Thank you very much, and please enjoy the video we present to you. Thank you. Tenho respeito pelo mar, mas o medo não tenho. Já vou ao mar desde a idade de dois anos. Portanto, há 68 anos que ando ao mar. Porque já andava ao mar aos pés do meu pai. Comecei aqui com a morte de uma falecida boa, porque depois a minha mãe começou à frente disto, junto com o Tony, no lugar do meu avô. E a partir daí comecei, comecei a, gostar, a gostar disto, não é? E, e tenho mantido até, até agora. <risos> então nós somos uma, uma, uma família. Ajudamos uns aos outros. Tudo o que é preciso, nós estamos aqui na, na arte, estamos nos ajudarmos aos outros. Eu nasci nisto, não é? Já o meu avô dizia, o meu avô, o, o, o meu pai, e depois eu nasci no estaleiro, então, praticamente. A arte chave é uma arte que vai ao mar, cerca e traz logo para a terra. Isto é mais pelo gosto que a gente tem de lá andar e para dar turismo, porque senão já não vale a pena andar lá muito. Adoro esta arte, pá. Eu adoro isto. E é uma homenagem que vou fazer aos meus anos passados. É uma paixão, porque se me tirassem daqui, estava sempre aqui o bichinho a morder. This is our boat looks like. Small, but strong, like the Portuguese. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. A very nice ending. Um, 
So uh, from uh, Portugal, we go back to uh, the UK uh, for the last uh, presentation category research uh, before a break. So I would like to invite uh, Erma Hermans. She is the Deputy Director of Conservation and Heritage Science and Director of Emital Care Institute at the Fitzwilliam Museum. She will present us uh, Miniare, the Art and Science of Manuscript Heritage. The floor is Thank yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's my great pleasure to represent the work of our excellent team of researchers at the Fitzwilliam Museum in the University of Cambridge by introducing the Miniare project. Um, as you can see, Miniare is manuscript illumination, non-invasive analysis, research and expertise. Um, Miniare pioneer, pioneered the use of non-invasive analysis combined with interdisciplinary research to unlock the secrets of medieval manuscript illuminators. And of course, their very intricate methods are very difficult to unravel, and this project was very much looking into that. Um, our multidisciplinary team um, includes curators, conservators, heritage scientists, working closely with photographers and digital humanities specialists. This is all about teamwork. It would not be possible to have that done by one particular discipline. You have to combine all these disciplines to really uh, do this kind of research. The team developed a, a method, and I'm not going to talk you through all of this, but uh, which uh, is an analy analytical protocol that sets the standard for this kind of research. They researched over 218 illuminated manuscripts between 2012 and 2022, and all the techniques we use are uh, completely non-invasive as we do not take samples and the instruments never touch these very fragile manuscripts. The equipment is portable, which allows us to travel to other collections in the UK and further abroad in Europe. And as heritage science is constantly evolving, it's very rapidly developing over the last 10 years, we were able uh, over the course of the project to include the very latest new cutting edge techniques in our protocol. So this is how it works. Every time we analyze a manuscript, we start with imaging techniques like infrared, uh, uh, reflectography, then we use um, uh, spectros uh, spectroscopic techniques, such as X-ray fluorescence, and all the results that we collect uh, are put together in a very comprehensive report, that, uh, a report that is intelligible by colleagues with backgrounds both in the sciences and in the arts. Um, and what is really important to emphasize is that collecting all these kind of scientific data is fantastic, but it only becomes meaningful if we tell the story that is revealed by these data. So that's a very, very important part of the project. Using this analytical uh, protocol, we made some remarkable uh, discoveries, uh, causing us to rethink how me medieval illuminators, most of whom are completely anonymous, worked. They were great innovators, as well as great chemists or early modern scientists, uh, ready to embrace the possibilities offered by new materials or the reuse of old ones. For example, um, we found uh, that uh, illuminators in 10th century Britain have recycled Egyptian blue, a synthetic, synthetic pigment they probably recovered from Roman artifacts. Later in the Middle Ages, 13th century illuminators in England and Italy arrived simultaneously at a new method for creating an artificial form of gold, a tin sulfide we call mosaic gold. And here you see a page uh, where that mosaic gold is extensively used. And here you see some details of that same page where you can see the little uh, particles of that mosaic gold. Um, we use also, since the last couple of years, a macro X-ray fluorescence, which is a scanner which produces elemental maps. 
uh, every element can often be related to a certain pigment. So these maps can be very useful for us to understand the pigments that these illuminators used without having to take any samples, as I already mentioned. Here you see our scientists uh, working um, uh, with the scanner. Uh, this is the uh, St. John's College Great Bible that goes into the scanner. It's, it's uh, totally non-invasive and incredibly uh, informative. And um, another example is this uh, cutting from a gradual uh, from Venice, 1420-1440. And I thought we should put a Venice Venetian sample in this talk, so to show that you know these methods are very much across Europe as well. And in Venice in particular, what is interesting is that in this document we found the presence of cobalt. As you can see in this map, this is, it's a little bit better on my screen here, but it's uh, the cobalt map, it indicates only the locations where cobalt is present. And that corresponds with a pigment called smalt. And smalt is a blue cobalt-based glass, which was developed by the glass makers here in Venice. And it traveled, that knowledge of how to make that traveled all over uh, Venice. And this morning we were in the St. Sebastiano, where uh, in the paintings of Veronese, there is smalt everywhere, uh, creating lots of problems because it loses its color. But also these illuminators used smalt. Um, so very interesting found. Uh, we have found that manuscript illumination was a question of collaboration. And um, here you see uh, another example of that in a book of hours made for a royal marriage in 15th century Brittany, infrared imaging, which shows the, if there is an underdrawing under the paint layers, um, has enabled us to see for the first time the very distinctive styles of preparatory underdrawings or lack of it, uh, made by three artists. So at least three hands worked on this particular manuscript. Uh, and it was clearly a collaborative project uh, which produced one of the most richly illuminated books to survive from that period. Uh, infrared imaging has also showed us uh, another breakthrough, allowing us to understand the international nature of such collaborations. We found instructions under the paint layers, as you can see here. This is the uh, page, and this is the infrared image. And you see these note note notes here, which indicate the color rot in German, uh, which is red. And here you see uh, part of a magnificent Bible written in 12th century England, color indications in this Bible found with infrared are in Latin, English, French, and Greek. And as you can see here, this corresponds with the uh, Greek name for purple. Um, all this shows that illuminators traveled across borders and worked in different locations from where they originally came from. In keeping with the Vin Fitzwilliam's mission, Miniare has not stayed in the lab or in the library. Uh, we revealed our discoveries through two spectacular exhibitions that married art and science. In 2016, the groundbreaking exhibition Color brought this work to the public for the first time. And last year, a more focused display on British illumination told the story of color use over 500 years through this particular research project. We work with school, pupils, university students, community groups, care home residents, and other groups of risk, uh, at risk of social isolation, using our discoveries to inspire creativity and foster conversations and connections. So you don't need to, fit, to visit us at the Fitzwilliam, but of course we hope very much you do, um, to be immersed in these beautiful books and our analysis of them as this digital research illuminated is free access online. And I would like to thank uh, the team that worked on this. Uh, none of this would have been possible without the support of our funders and the libraries and collections, whose col collections we have uh, worked on, uh, we were allowed to work on. Finally, we would like to dedicate this award to two former colleagues, Paola Ricciardi and Stella Panayotova, whose vision for a new way of working with manuscripts underpins what Miniare has achieved. 
And thank you to Europa Nostra for the award, despite us not being in the EU. In the EU. Um, so that's very much uh, appreciated that we can participate in this. And uh, as, as it uh, stimulates us as researchers to, uh, to work very hard on interdisciplinary and cross uh, Europe pro projects. Um, we want to continue this research with non-Western manuscripts, and which will give us even more stories telling and more st um, uh, information about travels of illuminators, methods, and materials in these fantastic, magnificent objects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Indeed, they are magnificent uh, objects. Um, so we have now completed the first part of the program ahead of time. Uh, thank you very much to the speakers for sticking to the allocated time. It means that you have gained a 15 minutes extra break. So we will meet again here in this room at uh, quarter to five uh, to continue with the next session. Um, for the ones of you who have not uh, collected the badge yet, you can do it at the registration desk. And by the way, if you have not noticed, these are eco-friendly badges that you can, uh, uh, you can plant at the end of uh, the Congress at the summit. It has uh, seeds of mint and mixed flowers. Um, there's a coffee break for you arranged in the courtyard. So enjoy the networking session and see you at quarter to five again. <laughs> yeah. We are now going to start with a new category. So please take a seat so that we can uh, begin with the first presentation. We start with category education, training, and skills. The first project is uh, Made in Crafts and Design Narratives, a European collaboration among Austria, Croatia, Slovenia, Serbia. I would like to invite to the stage Maya Kolar, or oh, you are here. Um, Maya, she is design, uh, curation, and management at OASA. And uh, Made In is a European platform which brings together designers, researchers, and curators who are all dedicated to exploring heritage through contemporary production. It promotes the invaluable role of crafts in shaping local identities and ensuring the sustainability of communities. Maya, the floor is yours. Thank you for having us. I hope everyone can hear me, and I'm glad to have you energized after the coffee break. Uh, I am here as a representative of a larger platform uh, called Made In, uh, of which we took on roles, multiple roles and uh, multiple hats. So we are both designers behind it, creative directors, also program directors, mediators, researchers, so it's uh, quite a particular storyline behind it. Uh, it includes uh, several countries uh, and several uh, institutions uh, that range from museum institutions and institutions w working with the cultural heritage from Slovenia and Croatia, as well as NGO sector in form of smaller associations and orga organizations working in uh, culture. We were also joined with a festival and an association of crafts from uh, Austria. To give you a short insight of the genesis of the story, it started with a self-initiated research project done by my personal design collective, which I'm one-sixth of, uh, that started investigating our local environment. Uh, we are based in Zagreb, and we were researching into this uh, particular uh, street side of Zagreb, of the longest street side in the city center that was occupied in history with a uh, quite large number of specialized store craftspeople and artisans and uh, was also a home to uh, a, a crafts guild uh, in time. Unfortunately, as in many Croatian cities, uh, in many uh, European cities, it has since been diminished. So we've started analyzing what's sort of the backbone of this and whether there is a way to re revitalize this valuable uh, knowledge of people and to uh, give them a new, uh, new perspective. 
Uh, aside from mapping them, we were interested in also re revitalizing this uh, particular part of the city by means of social design. And we've organized uh, quite a bit of actions and uh, programs that uh, included local residents trying to um, give them a viewpoint into what was happening in these courtyards that they maybe weren't paying enough attention to. Uh, it was since published in a form of a book, and this was the sort of a backbone of the Made in Project, which uh, has this uh, uh, full title called Crafts and Design Narratives. It is linking, uh, collab collaborate, uh, linking and uh, putting emphasis on collaborations between designers and craftspeople. And it is questioning where things are made, uh, what they are made of, who they are made by, and uh, who they are from. Uh, by using interdisciplinary practices that are very well known to us as designers, we are bridging uh, these different fields, and uh, the results were covered in several, several results. So the project ranged from uh, mapping craftspeople in all four countries. Uh, they were all cho chosen because of their particular expertise. If they were endangered for whatever reason or couldn't find an apprentice or uh, someone who could take over their knowledge, or were particularly interested based on a local phenomena. It was curated by um, curators in each of the country. Uh, it resulted in a, quite an extensive book that covered uh, the results of the documentation of the mapping, but more importantly, it focused on the actual collaborations that took place between the craftspeople and groups of uh, contemporary designers. Uh, that were chosen uh, based on their particular practices uh, that were challenging certain norms, uh, questioning uh, different alternative production methods, uh, and putting emphasis on uh, new technology. The results were quite uh, interesting. They were done in direct communication with the craftspeople locally themselves and resulted in a range of products, but more importantly, in a range of um, kind of question asking uh, uh, speculative uh, ideas. There were also workshops done with um, younger professionals and students that were more experimental in nature, uh, that were investigating and experimenting uh, with materials, and uh, ended up with being a series of a touring uh, exhibition in all uh, four countries that continued uh, since. Uh, importance of the project basically lies in this opportunity to open up the discussion around topics of exploitation of natural resources, uh, challenging ways of how things are being made, and it couldn't have been done without the participation of both active people that were uh, contributing to the uh, particular project or uh, the vast audience that was joining us. Everything is documented on a digital platform, and more importantly, it is uh, branching out to new partners, and we have have currently started a new uh, session uh, and the platform uh, kind of continues to grow on, which we are uh, quite proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this presentation. We move now to south of France um, for the presentation of Acta Vista. Um, I would like to invite to the stage uh, Pacarette de Maud-Menard, uh, Executive Director of uh, Acta Vista. Uh, since its creation in 2002, this association has developed training projects in heritage trades involving uh, 5,000 individuals uh, marginalized from the labor market. It's an innovative approach uh, which combines uh, training and uh, vulnerable um, citizens, social support, and a cultural dimension accessible to all. Please, the floor is yours, Blackley. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm very, very happy to be there among you with my colleague, Colleen, to represent uh, Acta Vista. Activista is a non-profit organization whose primary goal is not to restore heritage. So you might be wondering then, what is she doing there? I will explain it to you through a story. The story of Omar Safi, a 28-year-old Afghan refugee who arrived in France in 2017 under very difficult living conditions while going through the asylum application process. He was then accommodated 
in 2019 in a center for asylum seekers in Marseille, in south of France. After obtaining refugee status, he was directed to Activista. He was directed to Activista. He spent a year within our association where he found a work routine, colleagues, expectations, and support to help, me, to help him address issues like housing, health, and mobility. Even though he had never worked in construction, he participated on a restoration project at a prestigious listed 17th century military fortress in the heart of Marseille. He discovered the art of masonry in historical buildings, and it became a true revelation for him. Thanks to the training program offered by Activista and the professional support, he completed a professional qualification, found internships in companies, and then was hired by an historical monument restoration company at the end of his journey. Six months ago, he sent a photo of himself with President Macron, who had come to visit the workers on the Notre Dame de Paris construction site to his project manager. Like Omar, we welcome over 500 people in, in precarious situation to our association each year. Our primary role is to help them regain confidence and re-engage in order to find employment in any sector. We have chosen the base, to base our Get Back to Work programs on historical, historical heritage restoration because it's a great source of pride for these men and women to receive training and participate in the restoration of buildings that reflect our history and in which, in which they can inscribe their individual stories. We transform the sites entrusted to us into opener schools where everything is learned by doing and where the training pathways lead to a qualification. We work closely with our trainees to help them overcome the obstacles to employability and guide them to build and complete their professional project, whatever it may be. The magic of the project comes from that, the fact that we are restoring prestigious sites according to the rules of the trade, with teams undergoing training who, for the most part of them, have never worked in the building trade before. Today, with the group SOS to which we belong, we also develop a cultural branch in order to open the sites we restore through mediation projects to the public and make them accessible and alive. We also started to explore at the uh, Europe uh, at a Europe and Mediterranean level, European and Mediterranean level, in order to discover other initiatives, draw inspiration from them, and enrich ourselves through these discoveries. We are very honored and proud to receive this European Award in the category of education, training, and skills. It means a lot for all our, to all our teams, and we will be very pleased to welcome you to Marseille very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this inspiring uh, story of uh, Omar and uh, Acta Vista. I know that you already welcome uh, last week uh, Eugen Vaida, a jury member, during the unveiling of, uh, of the plaque uh, in Marseille. So that was the first uh, visit, and hopefully there will be many more in the coming uh, months by the Europa Nostra uh, family. Uh, so we remain in France, uh, but uh, we move to another project, uh, Carpenters Without Borders. So I would like to invite uh, Francois Calam, who is the fond f founder of uh, Carpenters Without Borders, to join us on stage. You have to use the green. Dear friend, uh, take care because my English 
could be for you a terrifying experience. <laughs> so <laughs> I do my best. Uh, anyway, uh, Carpenters Without Borders, or in French, Charpentier Sans Frontières, is a group of professional carpenter volunteers, women and men, who have come together for their pleasure every year since 1992. The aim of each meeting is to bring together a friendly and international team of around 30 people around a construction or a restoration site over a short period of one or two weeks. All the techniques we use to work with wood are manual, using hand tools, for instance, broad axe for hewing the wood. Far from causing suffering, this choice of pre-industrial techniques has proven its effectiveness and the pleasure that craftsmen take in using them. Furthermore, by practicing these techniques, we observe real reliability and authenticity. Hand framing techniques make it possible to respect the natural shape of the trees and to avoid deformations due to the breakage of the wood grain through the use of mechanical sewing. An intimate and generous relationship is established between the craftsman, the craftsman, and the living material he has chosen to work with. The result is increasingly appreciated and demanded in different countries by customers and architects. We were able to bring together a group of around 300 carpenters belonging to around 20 nationalities. One of our next objectives will be to contribute to helping Ukraine rebuild its wooden heritage, for instance, wooden churches or synagogues. The disaster case of the fire of Notre Dame de Paris Cathedral was an opportunity for us to demonstrate that it was possible to do at a time when the method of reconstruction was under debate. In July 2020, we were able to spontaneously create a full-size prototype of an, of an element of the medieval framework that disappeared in the fire produced in a very short time, perfectly respecting the instructions of the architects of the cathedral, this prototype made it possible to make the decision on the method of reconstruction entirely cut by hand. The material we used was the oak trees coming from the public and private French forest. We chose very straight logs low growing, the, trees, the tree cutting period was winter when the sap went down, respecting the calendar of the last quarter of the moon to avoid later wooden deformation. This is how the construction site is being carried out today, respecting the original measurements and the completion deadlines. A significant number of volunteer carpenters without borders were called by the companies responsible for the work to provide their know-how. The construction site of this French monument of universal value therefore calls for a joint contribution from experts from around 10 countries. It's an honor to be with you today and to participate in this European momentum around the values of humanism and generosity. Thank you for the welcome of Europa Nostra and for your attention. Thank you, Merci. Thank you very much, Francois. You did it very well. We could follow you perfectly without any problems. So. Um, then we go now to the extreme north, 
to Norway. Um, I would like to invite uh, Hasmund Christiansen, the director um, of the Ship Conservation Centers Association of Norway. I don't pronounce it in, <laughs> in Norwegian. Um, he will share with us the story of the National Centers for Restoration and Historic Vessels uh, from Norway. The floor is yours. Sure. So can we see the video? Uh, in Norway, we have a unique approach to raising awareness for historic ships and boats through the establishment of National Centers for Restoration of Historic Vessels. My name is Morten Hesthammer, and I'm leading the craftsmen here in Hardanger. Three national centers were established in 1996 with the goal of preserving and restoring traditional vessels in Norway and to make sure the old craft and shipbuilding survives. Each center specializes in different types of vessels. In Hardanger, we are specializing in restoring wooden vessels and doing woodwork on steel vessels. We do also have expertise in blacksmithing, rope making, rigging, and clinker building boats. Bredalsommen focuses on restoring iron and steel vessels, including riveting and steam engine repair. The Northern Center restores wooden fishing and Sami vessels and has extensive knowledge of engines and older electronical devices. The restoration centers play a crucial role in preserving Norway's maritime heritage. Not only do they restore and maintain historic vessels, but also serve as advisory services for vessel owners and regional cultural heritage administration offers educational programs and carry out historic documentation and research. The restoration projects serve as learning arenas for craftsmen, passing on traditional maritime skills and knowledge to future generations. In this way, the ship preservation centers manage expertise and pass on professional knowledge through restoration assignments and projects. The centers also attract international interest, craftsmen from all over the world contributing their expertise. The accessibility of these vessels to the public is also a crucial aspect of the project. The centers are, as museums, open to the public during working hours, providing a unique opportunity for people to experience Norway's maritime history firsthand. Through government initiatives, private and corporate funding, and long-term public support, we are serving the Norwegian fleet of more than 270 historic vessels. Like to In say, I would like to say two things. Um, firstly, about challenges. I believe that many of us have challenges with economy. So do we. The structure is there, but we still struggle with the economy. And secondly, the impact of our ships preservation centers is um, more sustainable protection of both tangible and intangible maritime heritage. Taking care of intangible heritage is a question about creating new structures in society. To do so, we need to work along several tracks, and one of them is politics. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to have uh, one of the visionaries of the centers here today. And I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Mr. Sverre Nordmo. He's sitting there. <laughs> he, uh, 
for his contributions and his understanding of how the, stru how the structures in society and politics are working. And finally, thanks to uh, Europa Nostra for giving us uh, the awards. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hasmund. Uh, this is a perfect uh, project for the year of uh, European, uh, European Year of Skills uh, this year. Um, so the last project in this category comes from Romania. Uh, it is represented here by Theodor Frolu. He is the vice president of uh, Ivan Pazajkin uh, Mila 23 Association. Uh, he will present us uh, the project Pathfinders of Waters, Danube Delta. Theodor. Thank you. Uh, how great is Europe and Europa Nostra? Because uh, seven, eight years ago, we visited uh, our colleagues from Norway to be inspired by them. So I'm very honored to present our project after their project. So, uh, when we see a man paddling in the middle of the nature, uh, we have a very strange, very special feeling. Why we have this feeling? Because it's about our relation with nature, which is something we are looking for. And when in this boat, the man, it's also uh, a legend an Olympic legend like Ivan Pazajkin, and uh, he, uh, you meet him in his environment, start to be an inspiration and uh, uh, a starting point for a project like ours. And now we see the project. Învață că se lucrează în echipă. Este foarte important să lucrăm în echipă. Dacă eu nu știu ceva, știe cealaltă și împreună facem treaba până la capăt. Alt avantaj ar fi că dăm de noțiunea asta de învățare cu sens. Adică de ce învățăm? De ce la școală facem geometrie? De ce facem matematică? Pentru că la un moment dat o să avem nevoie de niște noțiuni. Într-o lucrare pe care au făcut-o de la zero, au construit o bărcuză. Dar fără acele noțiuni, ei nu puteau să înțeleagă și să ducă mai departe proiectul lor. Fetele au făcut și treaba da. de băieți. Da! da. 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 chiar... Am dat chiar tot. Vrei să vă zic un secret? Spune! Fetele au făcut mai mult decât noi. Da. 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 Ne deplasăm cu o ambarcațiune făcută de copii care nu depășesc la vârstă 14 ani. Și dacă aceștia mai târziu își vor păstra dragostea față de construcția navelor în apărcațiunilor din lemn, înseamnă că am reușit să salvăm una dintre cele mai importante tradiții ale 
and you're not with me. So uh, we start uh, 13 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, Ivan uh, decided to leave us two years ago. So uh, our association, we continue uh, his project, his vision. And uh, we are trying to go to a next level. So after we start in uh, one small village and one small city at the entrance of Danube in Romania, we extend in the last four years the project uh, in Danube Delta in different villages. In, and the children, uh, each of this group of the children become part of a network, a national network of uh, pathfinder, pathfinders of water. And our dream is to extend the project all over, all along the Danube, and why not in Europe 2030 to have together what we call United Rivers of Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Theodore, so for the very nice uh, images. I've learned uh, only during the coffee break that one of the boats uh, was uh, built at the Pisco School, uh, who is one of the winner, um, winners from last year. So it's really a small world. And in Romania, you cooperate so well uh, among the organizations and the heritage uh, professionals. We are always very impressed uh, by you. Um, so this was the last uh, presentation uh, in education, training and skills uh, category. We can now move to the um, category citizens engagement and awareness raising. I would like to invite um, on stage the first uh, representatives from Belgium, Stein Kuhls, uh, director of uh, Anno Architects actually who won the, the second award in a row because they received a, an award also last year for the conservation of Aachen battery. I think that's a record, uh, <laughs> two, two awards uh, in, a, in a row. We'll try to be back next year in another okay, category. Okay, another <laughs> category. Very good. Uh, so Stein will uh, present us uh, the uh, village square mirror near Antwerp. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of Europa Nostra, I'm really honored to share with you the story of the transformation of the cloister Meer into a public village square. A bottom-up project that started already in 2007, so 15 years ago, by a small group of villagers, and they're there in the back taking pictures, so um, they're celebrating here with us today. Um, and the project showcases the incredible power of social values and community effort in shaping a new future for historic monuments. Uh, the village of Meer is nested on the border between Belgium and the Netherlands and is home to about 3,000 residents. The heart of the village is a small Catholic elementary school and cloister established in the late 19th century amidst Belgium school struggles. Over time, additional buildings, such as a parish hall, joined the site. Further, the site has significant landscape values, including imposing beach avenues, hedged lawns, which create a breathtaking backdrop for the monastery. In addition, there are four massive lime trees, stand as a testament to the site's long history. The heritage site has always played an important role for the villagers. It served as a place for education and as a gathering place for the community during weekends. Despite its official recognition in 2003 as a national monument, not to mention the cherished memories it holds to generations of villagers, the site faced an uncertain future when it was closed down in 2005. 
Private investors seized upon this opportunity to privatize and develop the site. However, a very small group of pioneering villagers, along with our team, collaborated to reimagine and preserve the cherished site. The local group of volunteers successfully worked together to acquire the site, secure permits, obtain funding for the project. In the process, they expanded their small group into a broad coalition consisting of local and regional authorities, social housing organizations, neighbors, craftsmen, and so on. The result of their extraordinary achievement is something we can all celebrate today after 15 years of lasting volunteering efforts. Together with the citizens, we aim to revitalize the site by focusing on its core element of social encounters. As such, creating the first ever public square in the history of the village. As depicted in this sketch, we arranged public functions around the square and advocated for new social housing units within the historic per perimeter to strengthen the social fabric as a central gathering place for the village. Our approach wanted to preserve the historic core and landscape structure by positioning new social housing within the perimeter of the monument. The final project consists of a community hall with library, a small bakery, a tea house, offices, holiday house, bed and breakfast, and 17 modern social houses. We concluded the project in late April 2023, following an intensive renovation campaign that started in 2019. A broad coalition of artisans, villagers, and craftsmen meticulously repaired and preserved all the buildings. The project is, of course, a remarkable story about repurposing monuments through adaptive reuse, blending old and new architecture, or even promoting urban densification while preserving landscape values. And of course, it was about linking heritage to the sustainable development goals. However, preservation was, in this case, never solely about preserving. The, po the project is founded upon social activism by volunteers who gathered community involvement of neighbors, craftsmen, entrepreneurs, politicians, and so on. The transformation of the site demonstrates how a social perspective produces meaningful results for preservation. The project shows us that new heritage imaginaries can emerge from engaging with local desires, such as creating a public square and park, over preservation itself. Preservation is here the consequence of a social dream, not the other way around. In closing, I'd like to express my deepest respect to everyone involved in this unique endeavor. So they're all there in the back, and they all um, um, deserve our praise. Your valuable efforts demonstrate that heritage preservation can be reimagined as an inspiring and creative catalyst for positive change throughout our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stein. Uh, you know that the deadline for submitting an application for the edition 2024 is coming very soon, on the 13th of October. So also for the ones of you who are thinking of applying, uh, so you still have a couple of weeks uh, to do so. We now move from Belgium uh, to Hungary. I would like to invite um, Barbara Zay. She's the project leader of uh, KEK, Contemporary Architecture Center. She will present us uh, the project uh, Budapest 100. Right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much. We are so honored to be here. This is a great honor for our organization and for Budapest 100, too, that we can be here. So the motto of Budapest 100, which is a community architectural festival going on from 2011, so 13 years by now, is that every building is interesting. Uh, it's a bold sp statement, we know, <laughs> but we have proven it over the years that it can be true if we recognize heritage where it is not necessarily obvious. Uh, where it all started was a former office building of, the, of a textile company which houses the Open Society Archives right now. And um, 
13 years ago, they decided that this building should be celebrated because it had its 100th birthday. But then they uh, extended the whole concept to the whole city uh, so that all of the 100-year-old buildings could be celebrated around Budapest. And um, since then, we have chosen different topics over the years uh, with which we could celebrate uh, different uh, eras of architecture, different uh, uh, areas of the city, and we could also choose buildings that were not necessarily uh, traditionally uh, heritage-protected monuments, and we could invite different communities to join in the celebrations. Um, when it was beginning, when the whole thing was uh, developed, the uh, Open Society Archives looked for a partner uh, to provide a professional background, and that's when the Hungarian Contemporary Architecture Center cake came into the picture. Um, we are an organization um, that has been present in Central Eastern Europe for uh, 18 years now, and we have a professional expertise in um, urban issues and architecture and different um, issues related to urban development. Uh, and we have many, many programs besides Budapest 100 uh, that are dealing with these kind of topics. Uh, and we do believe that architectural education and heritage is issues should be uh, available uh, to all age and social groups, and that heritage issues can and should be discussed between professionals and lay people, because they can provide an aspect that may not necessarily be, uh, um, that, may, that could contribute to traditional knowledge. Um, Budapest 100 is built on three main pillars. Uh, one of them is, of course, the built heritage. And uh, we are now choosing buildings, although these are very, very <laughs> beautiful details of Budapest buildings, we are now choosing buildings uh, based on their beauty or their state uh, at the moment. Um, but we are choosing different topics and uh, we are inviting the communities that live mostly in these residential houses uh, to organize programs together with our volunteers. And by coming together, these communities can share their memories and uh, by discovering the history of their own living spaces, um, they develop a sense of pride and belonging and of responsibility, of course. So they feel that they have more power to you know, shape their environment and uh, to, con to contribute to the preservation of these mostly historic buildings. And through sharing stories and sharing their memories, stronger and more close-knit communities uh, are um, developed uh, with the help of heritage. Uh, I have already mentioned that we are working together with volunteers. They are responsible for organizing the programs and keeping in contact with the houses, of course. We have an always evolving volunteer program with new team members uh, each year and experimenting with new communication and educational methods. Uh, and the volunteers uh, also gain a sense of community and new personal and professional relationships. We hope that through these kinds of programs, uh, exhibitions, uh, cultural programs, and um, building tours that are led by the volunteers, of course, and the residents, uh, we can show like a new face of heritage. Uh, and our researches are not only about collecting historical data, but also personal stories related to certain places. Uh, but we do have uh, really great professional partners. I have to mention the Budapest City Archives, who have been our uh, greatest partners over the years. Uh, and we are also uh, in an international cooperation with them called City Memories, which is, of course, about uh, more, gaining more accessibility to archival materials and presenting heritage and archives to people in a more accessible way. And Budapest 100 is a way of doing that. Um, but of course, uh, it's not about the buildings, uh, it's or not only about the buildings, but also about celebrating the people. In this case, a hundred-year-old lady in one of the houses. Um, and um, yeah, because of, this, uh, because of the simple methodology, Budapest 100 can also be adapted in different, uh, different uh, scenery and different places, uh, even more small, uh, more small scale um, settlements than Budapest and uh, not necessarily in historic buildings, but also among block of flats. So uh, last but not least, I would like to say thank you to all of the people who contributed to the organization over the 13 years, to all of the project leaders, all of the volunteers. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>
I would like to invite uh, Simon O'Connor. Uh, he is the director of the Museum of Literature uh, Ireland, Moli, uh, whose story he will share with us today. Good, good afternoon, um, everybody. We're really delighted uh, to be here and um, feel really privileged to be among so many exceptional European projects today. Um, the uh, Museum of Literature Ireland, uh, or MOLLE, as we like to call her, was opened in 2019, and we're a literary museum with a mixture of permanent and changing uh, exhibitions. And the museum is a collaborative project between uh, Ireland's largest university, UCD, and our national library, and it's set in the university's original home, uh, which is across three very beautiful historic buildings in the heart of Dublin. Um, Dublin itself is a UNESCO city of literature and is the central subject, actually, of nearly all of the work of the university's most famous graduate, uh, James Joyce. Um, within these buildings, we have placed contemporary exhibitions uh, that look at both individual writers um, and themes across uh, Irish literature. Um, and then uh, at the heart of the exhibitions are rare collections relating to Joyce himself, whose most famous work is the uh, European masterpiece, Ulysses. Um, Joyce studied in the room, uh, in the buildings, uh, in the museum buildings as a young man, as did many Irish writers. Um, the museum is also set in very beautiful gardens, uh, and that connection um, to nature became very important to the concept of the entire museum uh, experience as both an escape from the urban environment outside um, and then in a, a space that, uh, that encourages a connection with nature, uh, with art and with epiphany. Um, the museum also places a large focus on digital collecting uh, and online engagement. So our archive, um, which we call Radio Molly, uh, also doubles as a radio channel for Irish literature and has been active actually since before we physically opened um, the museum. And we've been working uh, very closely with Ars Electronica for the last year on a new version of that archive, which is going to launch shortly. Um, at the heart of the museum is an access philosophy that seeks to open up the literary um, art form for every kind of audience, uh, not just the ones who are particularly interested in it. So this was driving us really um, from the very beginning of this project, um, that as a museum connected to a university, we would place an emphasis on that democratic potential of education, um, and we've been developing programs from the beginning that look to connect groups um, uh, to that from every part of society. Um, we, began this, we began this work with the youngest audiences first, um, uh, opening up the museum with a, a program for children that didn't require any reading or writing ability. Um, and then as we moved up uh, the ages, we began broadcasting these programs to schools all over Ireland, so going directly into um, the educational system beyond the walls of the museum itself. Um, uh, now entering its fifth year, um, we have created a bursary for teen writers, um, which focuses on writing and creative mentorship, um, and mostly focuses on children who are outside um, urban areas around the country as well. Um, opening up our cultural space to young artists uh, and audiences is important to us. And to do this, we run uh, late night events every month, um, programming young early career artists who bring brand new audiences to our doors. Um, and this, I think, really expands our concept within the Museum of Literature of what the literary art form uh, contains. So these events also reach out to um, artists like performance poets, um, rap and hip hop artists, and they've become actually the most successful um, programming strand at the museum. Um, Developing the museum community and I think becoming a useful cultural space for all audiences uh, has, been, has seen us work closely with a lot of local community groups um, with the museum acting as a safe and encouraging space for writers in all kinds of circumstances. Um, during the pandemic, this work saw us um, go to people who were um, presenting as homeless, um, people who were uh, refugees living in temporary accommodation. Um, and then for the last year, we've been running a very special Ukrainian writers hub uh, for artists who are fleeing the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, alongside this, we've gradually included much, much older uh, audiences in work around adult literacy. Um, so we always felt that a museum of literature should be a place where somebody could come to learn to read. Um, and many of our participants in these programs have been living very, like physically very close to these museum buildings all their lives, but had never set foot into, in them um, up until recently. Uh, so we're hugely proud um, of the staff at the museum that deliver uh, all of this work. Um, 
our concept of what a museum of literature could be has always been driven by a desire to expand our own definition of who our audience could be um, and to build awareness of our art form in every part of society. Um, much of this work is less publicly visible than regular exhibitions, um, so to receive this acknowledgement from uh, the Europa Nostra Award is really very important to us uh, and I'd like to thank them uh, for that and to congratulate all of you on all your amazing projects. It's really lovely to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Very inspiring. Um, we come back now uh, to Italy uh, with uh, Valentina Suni. Uh, I would like to invite her to stay to the stage. She's the development project manager at Touring Club Italiano, and she will present us the project uh, open for you. Valentina, the floor is yours. <laughs> So, good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, as Touring Club, Touring Club Italiano, we are really honored to be here. But now, I would like to introduce you to Touring Club Italiano and to Open For You project with a short video. Aperti per voi è una delle tante iniziative del Touring Club Italiano, un'associazione privata senza scopo di lucro fondata nel 1894. Da sempre il Turing è al centro della valorizzazione del patrimonio italiano e chiede ai suoi soci di essere protagonisti di un grande compito, prendersi cura dell'Italia come bene comune, perché sia più conosciuta, attrattiva, competitiva e accogliente. Per questo il Turing contribuisce a produrre conoscenza, a tutelare e valorizzare il paesaggio, il patrimonio artistico e culturale e le eccellenze economico-produttive dei territori, attraverso il volontariato diffuso e una pratica turistica del viaggio etica, responsabile e sostenibile. Il progetto Aperti per voi rappresenta un esempio concreto di questo impegno. Nato a Milano nel 2005, il progetto favorisce l'apertura sistematica e continuativa di luoghi d'arte e cultura di varia natura, chiese, palazzi, teatri, musei, giardini, siti archeologici, tutti altrimenti chiusi al pubblico o visitabili con orari limitati. L'apertura avviene grazie al prezioso contributo dei soci volontari che dopo un'attività di formazione accolgono i visitatori, curano l'attività informativa di orientamento nei luoghi e promuovono la conoscenza dei beni comuni, generando senso di appartenenza verso il patrimonio culturale. Il Touring Club Italiano, con il progetto Aperti per Voi, promuove il volontariato e la cittadinanza attiva per rendere accessibili a tutti luoghi meravigliosi in tutta Italia. Aperti per Voi è un grande gioco di squadra, prima di tutto fra i volontari stessi che si impegnano ogni giorno nel progetto, ma anche con gli enti proprietari con i quali collaboriamo per rendere il luogo maggiormente visitabile, anche organizzando eventi, iniziative, visite, concerti, tutto ciò che possa rendere un luogo veramente accogliente e anche per creare un maggior senso di appartenenza tra i cittadini e il patrimonio culturale di una città. Oltre 80 luoghi, più di 30 città coinvolte, più di 150.000 ore di volontariato donate all'anno e oltre 21 milioni di visitatori accolti. La forza del Touring Club italiano è la sua rete volontaria. Oltre 1600 volontari attivi, sia operatori che fruitori, in un continuo scambio con il territorio. Essere un volontario del Touring Club italiano nel programma Aperti per voi mi permette di stare in luoghi molto belli e davvero ricchi dal punto di vista storico, artistico e culturale e penso che questo migliori davvero la qualità della mia vita e confido anche la qualità della vita dei tanti visitatori. Come cittadini europei la nostra priorità è prenderci cura ogni giorno di meravigliosi luoghi che appartengono a tutti e che fanno parte della nostra eredità culturale, promuovendo arte e cultura per trasmetterla alle generazioni future. And now I would like to share some of the sites we take care, for, uh, we, we take care of uh, to show how many and uh, how different they are. 
But before, a big, big, big thanks to our volunteers who are the real heart uh, of the project. And uh, now I propose you a quick tour all over Italy to discover some of the places. You, can, you can read maybe the sites if you want. Uh, Sorry? Do you want to read the site? Oh, they can read it no, themselves. It's, it's too, too many, it's too many. Too then go, yeah. So the, the places are very, very, very different. So we have a theater, charter house, botanical gardens, just to show how, yeah. how, many, how many different they are. Monastery in Bergamo, and uh, also different cities are, uh, are involved. Milano, and this is very interesting, it's Casa Verdi, the restaurant for musicians connected to the Giuseppe Verdi Foundation. I invite you to visit all of them, but this is particular. And uh, Naples and uh, archaeological sites near Rome, uh, palaces like this one in Cesano Maderno, uh, the Cathedral of Cremona, a small museum uh, connected to the ancient hospital of Milan, the Cathedral of Piacenza. Uh, this is very interesting in Milan, a museum home uh, with a very interesting collection of Italian art of the 20th century, so very, very nice, uh, a particular history. And this is Lorenzo Lotto in Bergamo, a small church in Salerno, very significant for the project, and Brescia, Cremona, Mantova, Milano again, Rovereto near Trento, Diocesa Museum in Padova, Royal Gardens in Torino, Bologna, Cimabue, Brescia, Capua, Castel Porziano Presidential Estate in Rome, Crema, Oristano, the Farnesina Collection, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Rome, the Anglican Church in Palermo, one of the last open, uh, Piacenza, the Eastern Greek Community Museum in Trieste and Quirinale Palace. Some of the smiling faces of our volunteers. And I want to end uh, with a big thanks uh, to the Aperti Per Voi staff that is here, <laughs> that with uh, great passion coordinates all the activities. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Valentina. Very impressive numbers and very nice smiles uh, on the images. We now, I see that you're already here, um, Milen. Um, we traveled to Portugal. Um, Milen Gil, she is the researcher of heritage science at Hercules Laboratory. She will present us the Almada project from Lisbon. Thank you, Bianca. Good afternoon, boa tarde. It was with a great joy that Almada project team learned about the winning proposal of Europa Nostra 2023. Project Almada is for everyone, anywhere, is a confirmation that we are on the right track when we invest in sharing knowledge and attracting different audience for the cause of cultural heritage. We are here today because of this man, Almaden Grej was an artist that in the first half of the 20th century dared to freely express his mural painting art at a time when in Portugal there was no freedom to do so. He was a self-taught artist making art for the people. He challenged himself in his works which intended to be already inclusive, participative, reflexive. And we as academic researchers also have this mission. It's increasingly crucial that we show what we do how we do it and why, why it matters. Almaden Gregus has left us five iconic smoother painting sets in Lisbon, and over the past two years, the research team has studied several and shared the results both online and in person. For the first time, the public was invited to climb the scaffolding with us, and the for the first time, children had the opportunity to pass time with one of our mother's granddaughters, although at first they thought that she was an actress hired by us for the purpose. 
And this was only two examples of the many activities carried on. Another project is a shift, proposed a shift of paradigm. And this nomination is a very important step following the Portuguese cultural heritage and its integration into European conservation policy. And now for you, especially for you, we would like to show the video that we have produced to commemorate this achievement. Almada is for everyone, anywhere, refers to the open and free science strategy and community engagement policies of Project Almada, an academic research which aims to deepen understanding and to promote the preservation of the mural painting legacy left by Almada Negreros, one of the greatest artists of the modernism movement in Portugal. From 1938 to 1956, Almada produced five iconic mural painting sets in Lisbon, that stand out on account of their artistic quality and monumentality. They are located in the center and on the city's riverside, and in terms of their artistic value, are comparable to other works in Europe and the Americas in the first half of the 20th century. However, until recently, they were largely unresearched from a material and technical perspective, under-recognized as cultural heritage and largely unknown to the public especially the younger generations. The Almada Negreras project was initiated in March 2021 to change this status quo with an innovative approach based on production of new knowledge about the materials and techniques used by the artist and past interventionary treatments. A safeguarding plan supported by a diagnostic survey of the paintings to understand their decay and aging processes. A dissemination plan founded on innovative and participative approaches. The Everyone Anywhere strategy of the Almada project is the establishment of a new open mindset for connecting academic heritage science research with the general public in a more inclusive, reflexive and interactive way. Activities include scientific guided visits to the paintings, hands-on workshops, appealing newsletters, interactive tools, videos, lectures, publications, and cultural events. For many, it is the first acquaintance with Almada Negreros and Almada mural painting art. For others, it is a fresh insight of his mastery as a mural painter. For most foreigners, the discovery of modern mural painting art in Portugal. For all, the consciousness and empowerment of cultural heritage as their own. In terms of cultural heritage, Almada Negreros murals are a privileged means to rethink the goals of today's society worldwide. The themes portrayed from the 1940s are surprisingly up to date and address the main concerns of UNESCO and the Council of Europe in regard to intercultural dialogue and the protection of cultural diversity. Project Almada, everyone, anywhere. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Milena. From west, we go to east, to Romania. Um, I would like to invite uh, Anna Sekeli. She's the executive uh, director of uh, the Zulaza Social Association and she is present, representing today the project uh, Via Transilvanica. Anna, the floor is yours. I think it's easier if you keep it in your hand. Okay. Click. So many of us gathered here today to celebrate so many great projects and initiatives across Europe. And I am so pleased and honored to represent Via Transilvanica and to receive this award. My name is uh, CK Anna, and I am executive director of the Shulasa Social Association, whose president is Alino Sheri, who is also here present. Our, organi our organization created Via Transilvanica. In fact, it's so fitting to talk about Via Transilvanica, whose motto and mantra is the road that unites in a room full of people that are here to celebrate each other from all across the European Union. 
our long distance trail that crosses Romania from northeast to southwest, a route of a little over 1,400 kilometers, is first and foremost about a sense of union. Already being here is a testament to that, a sign the mission of our organization, the Shuleza Social, is on the right path. And that just so happens to coincide with this beautiful trail. The Shulesa Social is an NGO whose mission for over 23 years has been to identify and provide solutions to environmental and community issues. In 2018, when our country was celebrating 100 years since the great unification of all Romanian provinces, the Shulesa proposed the idea of a pilgrimage route. We designed it as a trail that would unite people in their diversity and authenticity. We wanted a road to uncover Romania and represent its rich heritage across the globe. Our idea was to celebrate the ethnic, cultural, historical, natural, and geographical diversity of the country, which is still a mystery for the world, to create an honest ambassador of this country, not just to people abroad, but to Romanians as well. In order to love your own country, you need to truly discover it with all the good and the bad, accept it, and immerse yourself in it. And we knew we needed a change of per perspective, step by step, for 1,400 kilometers, with all the time in the world to absorb all these lessons. But Via Transylvanica is first and foremost a social project. It puts the emphasis on creating a context for economic development through slow tourism activities in rural areas in Romania which were otherwise in a severe state of depopulation, deforestation, and overall decay. The rural heritage is one of the most authentic in Europe, with people still living like they used to, cherishing traditions, while the spectacular nature in Romania consists of the last virgin forest in Europe. Both of these can be discovered step by step on Via Transylvanica. The trail is divided into seven cultural historical regions, each of them with their particularities. One of the most important things for us was to explore all the ethnic layers across Transylvania. Romanians, Hungarians, Seklers, German Saxons, Roma Gypsies, Ukrainians, Croats, and up to at least 13 more ethnic groups and their impressive heritage can be discovered on Via Transylvanica from specific architecture, culinary experiences, languages spoken, and more. Thus, the trail is divided into seven cultural historical regions as it follows. Bukovina, Highlands, Terra Siculorum, Terra Saxonum, <coughs> I'm sorry, Terra Dacica, Terra Banatica, Terra Romana. Besides crossing spectacular areas, Via Transylvanica is unique worldwide in terms of its signaling. The road is traversed by andesite kilometer stones that were individually carved by artists from Romania and even by some from abroad. These massive stones, made out of one of the roughest rocks there are, have become an art exhibition that stretches over 1,400 kilometers from the northeast of Romania in Bukovina to the Blue Danube in the southwest. This function is on top of another very important one, which ensures that no one will ever get lost in Via Transylvanica. Simply follow the beautiful stones guiding you ahead. One aspect that I'm very proud of is the Traveler's Guide on Via Transylvanica, a booklet I had the immense pleasure to write. For me personally, it was important that Via Transylvanica would be a trail for anyone. We wanted to market it for people of all ages, all fitness levels, social or economical backgrounds, etc. That's why I created a female group whose purpose was to document the trail in this book, which is not your regular technical guide, even though it's full of important information and details, is more a road story written to create desire and make people get off their couches and into their hiking boots. It took us little over four and a half years to finish building this road, even though in the beginning it did feel like swimming against the currents. We owe this to a great community of people who believed in this project and to all our national and international collaborators. This trail was founded with private money only and in close collaboration to national authorities, institutions, and organizations. All the work was done by hundreds of volunteers and people we call people of the road. Right now, we enter the new phase of the project, which might be just as difficult as the construction stage. 
It's a phase of focusing on maintenance and promotion of Via Transilvanica nationally and internationally. Already since 2018, when only a small portion of the road was ready, thousands of travelers started walking on this trail. We've had people from Romania, of course, Germany, France, Switzerland, <coughs> North America, Canada, or Australia. In 2022, we inaugurated and uh, the Finnish Trail through a great event happening in Alba Iulia, and even celebrating all the communities along the road. This event is called Via Transilvanica Day, and we wish to organize similar events in lesser known towns on Via Transilvanica. It's already happening. We've received recognition from national and international media publications, and the community of Via Transilvanica is constantly growing. Being here today is also part of this phase, and it's a great honor to receive this award so er early on. It's really a big impulse to move forward that was very much needed. Thank you so much personally, in the name of our president, Alinu Sheriu, our Tashulasa Social team, and in the name of all the people of the road. Thank you. Thank you. You can leave it here. I, I wanted also to uh, congratulate Europa Nostra for the 60th anniversary and a big thanks also to the European Commission and the jury, which is also present here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anna. <laughs> yes, you forgot this. No problem. So yes, we, we really hope that this award will help you in this new phase of uh, promotion. Uh, I know that uh, there are already a lot of uh, supporters of this wonderful uh, project. Um, our last speaker in this category comes from Ukraine. I would like to invite uh, Irina Zlokina. Uh, she is a researcher at Center for Urban History of East Central Europe for the project Unarchiving Post Industry. Irina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the recognition and uh, of course for the opportunity to talk and to present. Uh, so um, uh, I'm Irina Skolkina and I work at the Center for Urban History as well as my co uh, colleague uh, Sofia Diak who is also present here and uh, in cooperation with the uh, uh, University of St. Andrews and uh, Victoria Donovan who is also here uh, we uh, actually led uh, this project focused on uh, search, digitalization, and giving a new life uh, to uh, materials connected to uh, industrial era, uh, specifically in Ukraine, but also in the UK, in uh, several localities in the UK. And um, uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, how uh, this uh, very idea originated, um, uh, we know that um, in many places of the world, uh, industry or big industry is already not a kind of dominant uh, or influential factor. And so many communities which previously were exclusively focused on industry uh, declined. And uh, uh, our question was, uh, who cares? for industrial heritage when uh, the enterprises no longer operate. And um, if there are initiatives and people who care, uh, how can we maybe uh, also participate in this process? Uh, and uh, also, um, of course, another idea is uh, how to uh, share and to give a new life to uh, this kind of heritage, especially because industrial places or industrial towns are very often uh, considered or described as unique, as very special. Uh, if the heritage can be communicated, can be exchanged, and can be um, shared. Uh, and uh, in order to, uh, to address uh, these problems, uh, we also um, uh, found uh, great partners uh, for cooperation, uh, specifically in the uh, region of uh, Donbass, which is in the east of Ukraine, heavily industrialized uh, region. Uh, and um, uh, specifically, we cooperated uh, with uh, institutions uh, such as local museums in Kramatorsk, Pokrovsk, and uh, Mariupol. 
but also with many uh, private people, uh, collectors, owners, uh, who uh, shared their collections with us, and specifically uh, photographs, reels, um, uh, home movies, uh, uh, chronicles, amateur films, um, and also uh, the uh, histories, uh, the, uh, the memories of uh, working in industry. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I need to mention here that uh, not all of uh, our participants are able to celebrate with us uh, this, uh, this recognition of our project because, as you uh, know, uh, especially this region of Ukraine is now heavily suffering uh, from, uh, uh, from the Russian aggression and uh, part of the region is uh, temporarily occupied and uh, uh, um, some of our colleagues uh, uh, found themselves under occupation. Uh, some other uh, people are uh, displaced persons and they moved uh, to other regions of Ukraine or even abroad uh, where they uh, try to uh, keep uh, uh, their work going. And uh, also one of our uh, participants uh, is also serving as a soldier now at the front line. And um, uh, actually, uh, what, um, uh, what kind of um, materials we worked with, um, as I mentioned, different kind of uh, media, uh, which uh, mostly represent uh, like 20th century and especially second half of, of the 20th century. And uh, not surprisingly, um, what uh, we received uh, when we made an open call for uh, digitizing of, um, of uh, collections uh, of uh, materials uh, was actually uh, quite a typical uh, production for the socialist era, uh, especially official press, uh, uh, like state-funded uh, uh, cultural production, such as newspaper uh, photographs, uh, 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 industrial uh, films uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, similar materials, which uh, uh, most often represent a top-down perspective, very optimistic and very uh, even uh, celebratory and heroic images of uh, work in the industry. And of course, this is a big challenge for us if we uh, can uh, somehow uh, celebrate and uh, just preserve this heritage, or maybe we need some deeper reconsideration of it, especially as uh, today it is considered considered to be for uh, many people in Ukraine as a dark heritage, as unwanted part of, of our past. Uh, and uh, that's actually what we uh, managed to do is, uh, of course, to combine uh, this uh, top-down uh, statist accounts of the past uh, through this more like official uh, photography and uh, state-founded uh, photography and films uh, with uh, private collections and also uh, with uh, uh, some alternative accounts which uh, coming from um, uh, opposition uh, movements or uh, protest movements, uh, ecology movements uh, in the region of uh, Donbas, but also from other regions. Mm, and uh, uh, also, we decided that we need to uh, do further exploration of not only the cultural images uh, of industry, uh, but uh, those uh, cultural infrastructures and resources and power relations which produced them. And of course, another issue was uh, what roles uh, uh, this media, specifically uh, amateur film and photography, played uh, specifically in industrial towns and workers' milieu. Uh, so not only the images themselves, uh, like propaganda images, but of course uh, how they functioned and how they were reused and reconsidered by people and uh, by the communities. And uh, to give a second life to these digitized uh, materials, we also organized uh, uh, diverse events, uh, such as several exhibitions, uh, home movie days, uh, uh, where we cooperated with uh, also artists and owners, uh, and uh, also uh, summer school which uh, had an international character and we had uh, this opportunity to exchange with the uh, UK. Uh, also, we uh, did uh, oral interviews uh, with the former workers, uh, which uh, also became a basis for a documentary film uh, for, for the national media. And another 
a big strand of work uh, uh, took place in the UK where people uh, basically um, uh, did like two different uh, different strands together. First, uh, uh, in a series of uh, creative workshops with representatives of former industrial communities, uh, they explored uh, uh, their own industrial, post-industrial heritage such as uh, shale trails, um, uh, uh, like coal mining uh, heritage, uh, like industrial architecture and landscapes and uh, natural um, uh, places. And also, uh, secondly, uh, they also um, engaged uh, with Ukrainian collections uh, and gave a, a creative response to them, uh, such as poetry writing and, uh, uh, for example, also artistic exhibitions and also uh, such forms uh, as, for example, writing letters uh, to the people of Ukraine. And it was especially interesting when um, uh, uh, people from community, from a, a steel um, community in Abbey Vale uh, wrote letters to a very similar uh, like steel production uh, community in Mariupol uh, and with uh, some reflections on uh, photographs coming uh, from Ukraine. And uh, this was a kind of uh, a real exchange uh, between the people who experienced uh, industry as their own uh, life experience. Uh, and uh, uh, as I told, uh, uh, really the full-scale uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine uh, changed our project dramatically. And as I mentioned, uh, it's, um, uh, of course, very uh, difficult and painful uh, moment, uh, uh, also for industrial heritage as well as for, uh, for uh, the people, the representatives of, of these um, industrial communities. Uh, but we uh, stay uh, in touch and continue our work uh, also uh, connected to preservation of uh, private collections and uh, relocation and safeguarding of, of certain collections. Uh, and uh, uh, moreover, uh, when we are continuing um, uh, uh, tracing how uh, people, uh, like regular users, uh, continue to use, uh, to uh, recycle, to circulate uh, photographs which we digitized and shared open access online, uh, we can see that these uh, photographs are also um, uh, discussed today in the context of future uh, post-war reconstruction because, for example, when people are looking at photographs uh, of their native cities and places after the Second World War, they immediately start thinking about uh, how um, uh, their cities will be reborn after the ongoing war. So uh, we uh, really hope that uh, this part of heritage uh, will also play uh, this, uh, 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 this role uh, for the future for the future of these communities and, and the region. Uh, so thank you very much. And I also would like to thank, of course, to all the partners and uh, funding bodies who supported us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irina, for coming uh, to Venice. We are really happy to have you here with us. Please extend our heartfelt congratulations to your colleagues and uh, uh, we hope that there will be soon an occasion to celebrate uh, this achievement together. Um, we now move to the last uh, category, um, Heritage Champions. So we, will, uh, we are going to listen to the dedication and love, uh, lifelong uh, efforts of our Heritage Champions. I would like to invite on the stage the first of our champions, Ambi Tsangaris uh, from Cyprus. He's the founder of uh, Ambi's Printmaking Museum. You have to click here. I express my gratitude to the European Commission and to Europa Nostra for the honor of awarding me with the European Heritage Prize, Europa Nostra 2023. I express my gratitude to all those who worked in support of my nomination. I will continue to work with the same passion 
and for the same goals. When I was a young boy in my village, Condeo Famagusta, my friends and I communicated and bonded through our childhood games. Our world was magical and our environment rich in folk traditions. I was lucky to receive good advice from my parents and teachers, to love my fellow citizens, to stand by them, and to serve my country's good. This advice matched with my childhood games that continued throughout my life and has multiplied my happiness. The need to communicate and to give back to the community is with me always and is expressed to this day in the games of my adulthood, with which are printmaking and writing. These were never a profession for me, but a basic need, a means to express myself and communicate. My happiness in life has been to share my knowledge with the fellow human beings. Through my illustrated books of folk tales, legends, and traditions about the Kalikanjari, which are our tradition, the goblins of the 12 days of Christmas, through my research and through my free printmaking lessons for people of all ages, I try to promote and preserve our folk heritage. I felt the obligation to give back to the world what my teacher, A. Tassos, offered me freely. Today, many of my students feel the same way, and thus, the cycle of giving and love continues. My joy is immeasurable when I see the many teachers who attend the School of Printmaking learning to express themselves through art and then go back to their primary schools to teach printmaking to their students. It was like a game when first with paintings, then with printmaking and text, I spoke to my fellow citizens about the beauties of my homeland, about our, our folk heritage and culture, about the evils that have befallen it because of the intrusions of external forces and the recklessness of my compatriots. I took a clear stand. <laughs> Sorry. I took a clear stand for the common good and justice for the people of my country, regardless of the nationality. I am in my artistic work, I aim to promote and showcase the peaceful uh, coexistence of communities through joint events, strengthening of friendships, and the promotion of the work from other communities. I stand against the extremist forces that have brought in our present misfortunes. With the prints of artists from all over the world exhibited in the two printmaking museums that we founded in Cyprus with my friends, we promote the techniques and methods of printmaking, the history of printmaking, and the achievements of cultures from around the world. We have often exhibited a rich variety of folk prints from several European countries, as well as from other continents, giving the opportunity to the Cypriot public to 
to experience these cultural treasures. We will continue to work tirelessly with the same passion to make our world a better place. We are all volunteers with a passion for service to the community. I am honored to have such partners. It is fair that I share the European Nostra Award with them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations for these uh, remarkable achievements in uh, fostering connections and understanding among uh, communities in Cyprus. This is uh, very important and you are doing it uh, through uh, printmaking. Uh, we move now to an international uh, project uh, dealing with uh, Ukrainian cultural heritage. I would like to invite the stage Andreas Segerberg uh, to present us uh, Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, Sucho. Uh, Andreas is a research engineer at the University of Gothenburg. Yes. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it says uh, the University of Gothenburg. That has very little to do with why I'm standing here today, but we all have to uh, put food on the table, right? So, I'm going to talk about the social engaged digital humanities, the Saving Ukrainian Culture Heritage Online, which is a grassroots movement. We are so non-governmental and non-profit that we're not even a non-profit. We are, as I said, a grassroots movement with over 1,500 volunteers from 38 countries that has worked since the full-scale invasion uh, of Ukraine uh, to archive uh, websites. Well, that's how it started. Uh, it started as an emergency web archiving project, and we managed to uh, save 5,400 uh, cultural heritage uh, websites from museums, archives, special collections, and uh, so forth. From there, we have uh, grown into to more projects. Uh, I think it's too late maybe to change my presentation, but I, maybe I've ruined the chance of getting nominated next year, but so be it. Uh, we have also raised a lot of money. Well. Uh, a lot of money for, <clears throat> for a cultural uh, heritage institution. And we have managed to donate equipment for further digitization to 71 cultural heritage institutions in Ukraine. So, the first I would like to say is something about why emergency web archiving. The websites uh, of cultural heritage institution may contain unique documentation of tangible and intangible cultural heritage. And these websites and the content, they are stored on physical servers which are vulnerable to physical and virtual attacks, which could include looting, blackouts, uh, cyber attacks, which is something that we have seen happen too. But most importantly, why we started this uh, project and it was a successful uh, project it was that the web archiving we were a lot of people that were doing or thinking what can I do, what can I do from my perspective, my profession can I help with something uh, and actually that is something that we could do because this could be done passively uh, without the active participation of the, the institutions we could make backups of their websites and the content on them so this is a picture, uh, well, some pictures of <clears throat> uh, that we asked all volunteers to take. Actually, the, the, the duck sucks, that's me, uh, <laughs> of their setups. So people from all over the world started up their old computers and starting to web archive Ukrainian cultural heritage sites. And it was all organized over pretty much a night. And it was, uh, we made use of Google spreadsheets. 
have you ever used Google Spreadsheets? It's a, you can do like a collaborative editing and stuff like that. For me, usually it's, it's a disaster if it's more than me, but we had more than 600 simultaneous uh, uses in the spreadsheets editing and, and putting in metadata on, on uh, websites that needed to be crawled. And it worked. And I think it's that we, we only shared uh, some sort of domain knowledge of, of the cultural heritage that made this, this work and everyone was very uh, respectful to one another. So, the project actually developed into different sub-projects or projects in their own <coughs> um, right. We have a gallery where we exhibit uh, Ukrainian culture heritage. There's a project that collects uh, war-related memes that you can please visit. And we also have an equipment fund where we raise uh, funds for buying digitization equipment for uh, Ukrainian culture heritage institutions. And since we donated a lot of these equipments, we, uh, we asked, what do you need? We, we, we archived your websites, we, we gave you um, uh, equipment, is there something else? And it was very clear that they wanted, our colleagues in Ukraine wanted education. So we started this uh, project that's called Memory Savers, which was or is a summer inter internship program for next generation digital preservationists. And we provided a scholarship for students and equipment for the institutions. So the students went to different institutions in Ukraine and did their own digitization project. And after the, the uh, the project is ended, the institution, of course, uh, keep the equipment. Uh, I would like to say that this journey of, of, of suture has been a lesson learned, and that is that it's only open culture that is safe culture. Digitization and open access are not luxuries, but they are necessary precautions. Someone else needs to be able to save your data if you cannot. These are just some of the, the sponsors, cooperation partners, and technical partners that's been involved in this project. And with that said, I will thank you. Thank you, Europa Nostra, for the honor. Thank you to my fellow speakers here. And it's been a real, really great an opportunity uh, to take part of your projects. And. Uh, Thank you, the audience, for your attention and solidarity with Ukraine. Thank you for sharing your experience uh, with us, Andreas. Uh, very inspiring. We move now, uh, we come back to Italy. Um, I have the pleasure uh, to invite on stage the musicologist uh, Sergio Ragni. Uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Quello verde. Il video? The image on the screen are photographs and videos of my Neapolitan house my home, where for about 60 years I have collected historical testimonies of my passion for the music, and in particular for melodrama of the early 19th century. Absolute protagonist of my collection is Gioacchino Rossini. Why Rossini? because Rossini is the only Italian composer who, in addition to referring to the tradition of Italian operas, always wanted to deal with the great models of Viennese classicism. The idols of the young Rossini 
where Joseph Haydn and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Rossini was a very precocious genius who immediately re achieved the resounding success right from his first work. His popularity was such that for about 20 years, his opera were the most represented, not only in Italy, but also in Vienna, London, Paris, and so on. Rossini was known all over the world. Stendhal, in his Vie de Rossini, published in 1824, wrote, Rossini is spoken of in Moscow as in Naples, in London as in Vienna, in Paris as in Calcutta. Yet, Rossini was never satisfied with so much success. As he continued his quest for perfection, he became a great admirer of Beethoven's work. When in 1822 he went to Vienna, a city that decreed one of his most exciting triumphs for him, Rossini wanted at all costs to meet Beethoven in person and went to his house to pay him homage. In 1836, Rossini went instead to Frankfurt, where he met several times Mendelssohn, with whom he deepened his knowledge of the composition of Johann Sebastian Bach. Then, when in 1860, living now in Paris, he received a visit from Wagner, speaking with him about the music of the future, he confided to him that the greatest consolation of his old age was the study of Bach's compositions. If Beethoven is a prodigy in humanity, Rossini said to Wagner, Bach is a miracle of God. This exclusive characteristic of Rossini, these primates of Rossini, were at, at the age of only 37 and in the midst of his international success wanted to retire from the stage. This always fascinated me. My project has always been to give Rossini back his rightful place in the history of music. Today my project is to make my museum public by expanding it to a dimension that allows the many young people who already visit and frequent it to study and deepen their research in the musicological and performance field. I was able to ascertain that the emotion arose by being able to get close to the autograph works of art and memorabilia in my collection without the exhibition barrier of official museum, but in a dimension of a lived and shared life stimulate the potential of young students. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this very nice journey throughout Europe and uh, Rossini. Um, we travel now to Portugal um, for the presentation uh, uh, of an archaeologist, uh, Claudio Torres, who unfortunately cannot be with us uh, today because of health uh, problems. But he will be represented by Francisco Vega, consultant at uh, Campo Archeologico de Mertola, the Mertola's archeological site. Claudio, uh, Francisco, the floor is yours. And that's the one? That's the Green, one. yes. Yeah. Hmm. So good afternoon. And uh, let me start with a question that was raised 45 years ago 
How is it possible that from 500 years of Islamic presence in Portugal, there's only a huge void? Claudio Torres dared to look for the answer 45 years ago. The old city of Martula, Muslim name of Mertula, plunged into oblivion after golden periods in antiquity and the Middle Ages, and very little was known about the Islamic period in Portugal. He settled there with a small group of volunteers and experts attracted by the originality of the project and guided by Claudio Torres' charisma, vision, and determination, they started revealing a long forgotten heritage wealth. Mertula, where Christians, Muslims, and Jews once lived, worked, and traded together, sharing their lives and graves, showed us that we belong to a larger Mediterranean and European community. Little by little, Several generations of archaeologists, historians, anthropologists, curated restorers, and so on, came and keep coming to Mertula and its archaeological sites. And the tireless ability of Claudio Torres to gather people and build bridges paved the way for national and international cooperation. He transformed the Mertula archaeological site into a fundamental scientific tool, connecting the academic world to a unique local development project. Always, really always, with the community, the people at the heart of his work and life. So let me show now a bit of what Claudio Torres did and of what Mertula is today. Em 1978, Cláudio Torres cria o Campo Arqueológico de Mértola. Desde então, o seu percurso, o seu projeto e a sua vida confundem-se num só. O Vida Mértola foi uma descoberta, porque era uma vila no fim do mundo, pobre, o sítio onde se sentia ainda aquela coisa muito característica, que é o cheiro da miséria aqui na Vila Velha, os bandos de crianças ainda a correr, isso foi aquilo que marcou profundamente o, o abandono e, principalmente, um desejo imenso, uma população que cria novidades, que cria uma nova e uma nova vida. Ao longo de mais de 45 anos, foi revelado o admirável património romano, paleocristão e de origem islâmica. Foram criados 14 núcleos museológicos e editadas dezenas de publicações. Mértola, pela mão de Cláudio Torres, ajudou a reescrever a historiografia portuguesa. Entretanto, andámos à procura do Islão, não é? do Islão, que era a, a tradição, é a questão da Mértola, é a única terra do país que tinha ainda uma mesquita comprovadamente, estava ali ainda a mesquita, portanto tinha havido uma grande comunidade islâmica, portanto era essa que andávamos à procura. As pedras de Mértola, a que Cláudio Torres deu uma visibilidade ímpar, mostram testemunhos das línguas latina, grega, romance, árabe e portuguesa. Para esta altura também, a própria escavação, lá em cima, na, no bairro Almoada, encontramos uma série de peças cerâmicas que tinham uma certa decoração e foi aí, pela primeira vez, que fizemos a ligação entre a decoração da cerâmica da época Almoada com a decoração das mantas que estavam a ser levantadas na região. Portanto, hoje sabemos que está ligado, precisamente, a uma cultura de origem berber, que existe aqui ainda hoje no Rif, norte-africano e na Cabília, e que se estendia aqui para o sul da Península. Mértola transformou-se. Hoje, milhares de pessoas visitam-na todos os anos. A comunidade reapropriou-se da sua história e tornou-se parte do seu próprio futuro e desenvolvimento. So you are all welcome to Mertula. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will, uh,
welcome to Mertula uh, very soon. Uh, it's now time for the very last presentation. Um, I would like to invite uh, Monsignor Darius uh, Ratz, uh, the Roma Catholic Parish of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who has just arrived from Krakow. Uh, he will present us the Wittstowitz uh, altar piece in St. Mary's Basilica. The floor is yours. Thank you. Let me start uh, with uh, Italian words, Buonasera a tutti, qua. Uh, a Venezia. I would like to present the complex research and conservation works on the white stos altar in the St. Mary's Basilica in Krakow. A masterpiece of uh, white stos, Krakow's uh, altar of Dormition Assumption of St. Mary, is a late Gothic wood sculpture. It is presenting the story of life of St. Mary, and the altar also symbolized the city's uh, prosperity during Krakow's uh, Golden Age. When, in this time, greatest artists and craftsmen from whole Europe were active in the royal capital, and the complex research and conserva conservation works are a proof of care on this unique masterpiece of medieval and also European sculpture. Extensive international consultations were an important uh, task aspect of the project. They involved experts from Frankfurt, Munich, Florence, Brussels, Glasgow, naturally Nuremberg, to exchange know-how and suggestions on the wooden masterpiece. I'll be shorter. The grassroots initiative produced uh, an interdisciplinary conservation team. I would like to say thank you to all of members of uh, our team uh, that operated by the parish and involved scientists, experts in heritage research, protection, conservation, with a focus on wood. In 2015, conservators, restorers begin their work with full respect for earlier interventions that uh, temporary project lab operated on site behind altar for over 1,000 days. Yes. Visitors could watch the conservators at work as a scaffolding was built for the conservation of the sculptures in the central corpus. Works uh, involved over 200 figures and thousands of individual sculpted elements. The largest of the figures extended three meters and 250 kilos. The Retable gained many new aspects and research on, and conservation discoveries provided plainful new know-how. The works unveiled the original Gothic complexion of figures and framing, which allows the visitors to see the original intentions of the Grandmaster White Stoss. Archives and uh, consultations helped to return the arrangement of the altar from before the 19th century Research and analysis served developing the concept that detailed guidelines for the fire prevention and uh, emergency evacuation. Notre Dame de Krakow, St. Mary's Church in Krakow, is a hallmark of Krakow. The church is part of Old Town which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Its value can be expressed through contribution to faith of Christians, also 
enhance the tourist attractiveness of the city, development of international networks, involvement of science and education, and reinforcement of the sense of pride of the city's uh, unity. And I'm sure that the most recent conservation works will allow the coming generations several decades of worship and admiration for its artistic mystery. And in the end, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I would like to invite you to Krakow, Buonasera, uh, Buonasera qua proprio in questa bellissima Venezia. A tutti, grazie. Grazie mille, thanks a lot. We made it, so we went through 30 projects, 30 very inspiring stories uh, for all of us. And now it's the, the most difficult uh, moment to, to make conclusions. But I found uh, two persons, uh, perfect persons, who will do it uh, for us. So the first one uh, is Catherine Magnan. Uh, head of unit at the Cultural Policy DG EAC uh, from the European Commission. So please, Catherine, share your thoughts after such a long uh, afternoon. With pleasure. Good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, award winners, heritage champions, and uh, heritage um, lovers and, and friends. It is truly a privilege um, for me to be able to um, close this excellence day. A privilege to be in Venice first, uh, where we are surrounded by beauty. It's simply breathtaking. We are surrounded by history as well, many, many, many layers of uh, history that are really a privilege to uh, look at and be part of. It's also a privilege to be in Venice because we, we're not quite sure that our grandchildren or grand-grand-grandchildren will be able to see it. So for me, it's very humbling to be here, uh, to be able to, to, to gather in such an amazing place. Then it's a privilege to be a partner to be partnering with Europa Nostra uh, for this uh, prize, of course, for heritage. It's been a partnership that has been lasting for 21 years, right, Sneska? Yeah. And over those 21 years, we've had 3,741 applications from organizations and individuals from 46 countries. Today, we have 30 winners, 30 laureates, and that, that's wonderful. But it's an amazing partnership, um, and it's an amazing privilege to be able to, you know, do this um, award with you. And then it's a privilege to be with the award winners and to uh, listen to you, because you are the life and blood of cultural heritage. Today was about your talent, your passion, your skills, your excellence, but not only. It's also a story of determination, patience, and generosity. I'm always struck when I hear, um, you know, your stories. Of course, you know, by, by the excellence you have in your crafts and your, 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 the techniques and uh, the way you handle heritage, but it goes so much more beyond that you are also able to be so determined to carry out a project through years. And again today, I, I heard the Via Transylvanica, you know, it took four years and a half to uh, the lady who put this project together to carry it out. Or the Mer um, village uh, square, um, we heard the story of, we heard that volunteers invested 15 years of their time to get this project through. So that's amazing. It's also a story of generosity. We heard a lot about transmission, giving to others, giving back, giving to students. 
That's what we heard from the heritage champion from uh, Cyprus. I want to give back what I've been given by my teachers. Um, that's true of all of you, giving back in Ukraine, giving back sometimes also in difficult uh, areas like unwanted cultural heritage, like we heard in the Donbass region. So truly, Always a pleasure to be here, uh, to be, um, you know, moved by, by your stories and inspired by uh, your passion and uh, determination. Now, um, I, before coming here this morning, I arrived from Madrid. So, you know, I mean, I also work in Brussels, a gray city where it rains and we've got boring buildings, but this week is special. This week was started in Spain and is ending in Italy, and it's amazing. Why was I in Madrid? Because um, I came from the, 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 you know, further south in Spain, where Spain, who is holding the presidency of the EU, had organized an informal ministerial meeting. So they gathered the ministers of culture of the EU in an informal manner, so that to have an exchange um, that is, uh, you know, more fluid, there will also be, in November, like always, a formal meeting with a formal agenda, etc. And the meeting we had in Cáceres, uh, where for the first time, the new commissioner for um, culture and education uh, from Bulgaria, Mrs. Ivanova, took part. So this meeting had two um, main topics of discussion. The first one was discussing whether what we can do to have culture recognized as one of the pillars of sustainable development and possibly be a specific goal of the sustainable development goals put together by uh, the UN. The second part of the discussion was about how to protect cultural heritage from climate change and how to learn from uh, cultural heritage about lessons and the techniques that were proven in time and can be really useful to us now trying to fight um, heating and uh, all sorts of uh, consequences of climate change. It was a very, very interesting discussion. And um, I'm mentioning it here because um, at the end of the meeting, a declaration was adopted. It's entitled the Caceres Declaration and it's quite new, un, unusual. It is a very poetic document put together by the Spanish uh, Minister of Culture and his uh, colleagues in the ministry. And um, they managed to get consensus from the other ministers on this text. And it's a beautiful text and a very strong one. So I want to read just two paragraphs. And um, it goes as follows. That's, those are the first, the first paragraph of the declaration. Culture is what gives meaning to life. Culture widens what is real through what is dreamt. Culture turns the banal into the essential, the ephemeral into the eternal. Culture makes the small giant, the perishable infinite. Culture is rights, culture is freedom. Culture is progress and above all, democracy. And then the text goes on, and I will now read just the three last sentences. For all of these reasons, from Cáceres, we affirm, we, ministry, uh, ministers of culture of the EU, that culture is heritage, history, and memory, because these are the wellsprings of the future. Culture is, in short, a right for these citizens that is an obligation for the public authorities and every individual to safeguard. This is why we are making this commitment today so that culture will henceforth be considered as an essential public good, a global public good at the highest policy level. Those are very strong words. They were adopted yesterday and I wanted to share them with you today because I think they do really apply also here uh, to, to this meeting. And now, those are the very last words from me. I would like um, you to uh, share a round of applause for the people who made this meeting possible. And this, you know, as you can imagine, it's a huge work to organize 
this award ceremony with all those candidates and winners, etc. So a round of applause for Elena Bianchi. <laughs> And uh, she's got many colleagues, but I cannot quote them all. So the yeah. Europa Nostra team. And then, of course, also in the commission, in uh, our department, uh, and in the agency, the executive agency, who um, helped us with all the contracts. We also have very dedicated colleagues who make this Heritage Award happen. So there is Juliana Ott and uh, Alejandro Ramilo, who also deserve a round of applause. And I started with a privilege, which starts with a P. So while listening to uh, the speeches, I thought I would end with three P. Not the public-private partnership that sometimes, you know, is spoken about in, you know, the way, one way to fund culture, but partnership, patience, and passion. I think that's what binds us, Sneska, uh, in this partnership on the uh, European Heritage Awards. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, Nesca, yes, probably want. Thank you very much, Catherine. Yeah. It's a privilege uh, for us as well to work with you. So now our Nesca's Nostra <laughs> to conclude the excellence uh, day. What a day, what a day, what an excellence day. Um, what an emotion after this very, how many, 30, 30. presentation, one more exciting than the other. Um, as you said, just uh, um, Catherine, wonderful illustration of the three Ps, partnerships, uh, patience, and passion. Um, thank you so much, all of you. All of you are the champions, though I know that we have this cat one category is the heritage champions, but all of you, of course, who have just now presented are extraordinary heritage champions. And we uh, at Europa Nostra with the European Commission, it is a privilege indeed. It is a privilege to have you all gathered uh, in this amazing city, in this extraordinary hall, and to, you know, with the sense you have given us so much positive energy and you have given us so much hope that uh, we can prevail, that we can prevail over so many uh, difficulties and uh, challenges that Europe and the world is facing today. So the first thank you is for all of you and I look so much forward to tomorrow night when we are going to celebrate you, then you can just relax. You don't need to make the presentation. We will be applauding you and honoring you at the Palazzo del Cinema. So I hope it will be, uh, I know that it will be an yet another extraordinary uh, evening of celebration, European Union and Europa Nostra together of heritage champions. Uh, Catherine, Indeed, 21 years, it, we are becoming um, uh, majeur of, of this extraordinary journey together. And we started earlier, but it is really at the moment uh, when, when we really started the partnership between the European Commission and a civil society organization, Europa Nostra, that this award started uh, gaining uh, every year more and more prestige uh, and respect, and now people are talking about European Oscars for cultural heritage. So to, tomorrow, um, the team has chosen Palazzo del Cinema, as you know, the Mostra di Venezia, the Venice uh, Film Festival is taking place there, the red carpet event, but as Elena said, this is going to be a green, grass carpet event uh, for all of us because we want really to also contribute uh, to some fundamental values that we are all um, uh, very much committed to. Um, so thank you for that partnership and Catherine, you especially 
because we have been building that momentum, in particularly since the famous 2018 European Year of Cultural Heritage, and it is great to see that the momentum is continuing. And thank you for reading these very poetic and very forceful words from the Cazares, uh, uh, Cazares. Uh, um, declaration for us. We read it with uh, great uh, excitement this morning. We had uh, a meeting in the Giardini Reali, a meeting with uh, a series of uh, cultural networks that came here to uh, Venice to uh, attend the entire summit, and then we discovered, in particularly with this, the, the, the tone, as you said, the poetic tone. And you know what? I was thinking, what has happened? It was really a document different than other uh, documents. And I thought perhaps they have read the, this publication. And perhaps <laughs> that is what gave them uh, uh, extraordinary inspiration. And they just transmitted that into a very, very forceful uh, declaration. And with all the networks this morning, we said we want to send to the ministers a message from Venice to Caceres with love. Um, so I think that th something is happening. Something is happening in Europe. I think finally we, the decision maker understanding what, what a power, what a power and unused, un non-sufficiently used potential uh, is uh, our culture and cultural heritage to bring us together and to overcome so many challenges. So that's why we are so excited to have you all, of course, the laureates, but so many members of Europa Nostra, so many partners of Europa Nostra, so proud of this partnership with the Fondazione Cini, 70 years of promoting the soft power of culture and knowledge. Are we really peripheral or are we central to the European project? So we deeply believe that we are central. That's why uh, on Friday we will also launch a, a Venice Manifesto for a recognition of a concept of a European cultural citizenship. We can be proud of being, culturally speaking, citizens of a European cultural space without frontiers, and all of us, we are that. So that's something that from this extraordinary uh, city, Venezia, la europeissima, we are going to launch that message. And I hope that many of you will be with us at that meeting. But before that, uh, we are also going to have tomorrow, before the evening celebration, we will also have uh, um, a very first public, large public event of the European Heritage Hub. This is a um, pilot project launched by the European Union, and we are very grateful, Europa Nostra, together with a formidable um, consortium of European and national and local partners, including a number of cities, uh, Athens, Krakow, uh, Lisbon, uh, Venice. Uh, we are uh, going to work further in building bridges, 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 synergies, synergies, synergies between heritage stakeholders, champions, programs, in order really to um, put uh, what we were saying, to put a heritage at the heart of this transformation of our society, which is a triple transformation. And, uh, to start with, and green, and digital, and social, and heritage, and culture in general is really an incredible resource which is not sufficiently recognized. And tomorrow, uh, I hope that many of you will be with us, we have the first Heritage European Heritage Hub Forum uh, dedicated to uh, heritage and climate action. And many projects that we have heard this afternoon stressed the value of uh, sustainability and the necessity to contribute to uh, saving the planet as well. So I think we need uh, a lot of uh, what Alexandra Mitsotaki, one of our um, colleagues who will be speaking from Elefsina on Friday, she always said we need uh, not only 
AI, artificial intelligence, we need ancestral intelligence, the, the other AI, and many of your projects have been uh, demonstrating that ancestral uh, intelligence. So I hope you will be there because we will launch a call to action um, to mobilize the work of a uh, world of art and heritage for climate action here in Venice, one of the cities the most endangered uh, in Europe and the world among other things because of climate uh, change. So this is, again, the spirit of the place, the symbolism of this place to inspire us to do more, to do more because the momentum is here, but we have to do much more all together. And uh, Bertrand, when we were just uh, uh, at the end of this extraordinary uh, journey through Europe, uh, he said, uh, Bertrand, there was so much humanity in what you have all been communicating. So perhaps we should add to the motto, unity in diversity, humanity in diversity, and that's what we all stand for. So thank you for being here, and now just go and get yourself lost in Venice. We thought we should give you a free evening, that you choose the place you love the most, uh, or you want to discover something under the golden hour and under the moon. So have a wonderful, wonderful evening, and see you tomorrow morning for a morning breakfast at the Giardini Reali. So this is the place where we will meditate for a moment in the location of one of the award winners, the award winner from Venice. So thank you so much. Enjoy and see you tomorrow morning. I also want, as a very proud Secretary General, to say how proud I am of our dream team. And there is Elena, but there is so many more. And there is Audrey, there is Camila, um, Carla, um, Barbara, um, Louise, Barbara, Louise, Beppe, Beppe. Beppe. They are Joanna. all working yeah. now in various places. They are really doing a wonderful job. But Elena, yeah. you are here for them. Yeah, I represent them. <laughs> there are uh, Vaporettos waiting for you uh, outside uh, as of uh, 20 past uh, 7. Uh, so in 20 minutes, more or less.